Anyway, I bumped into her and she wanted to become director. And she's like, hey, by the way, I saw you at the meetings and uh, I had to tell you about some movies I'm coming in. And I was like, oh, you might be on my radar now. Sure. So, I don't know. She's, she's so, such a considerate person and she has so much knowledge. Wow, that sounds ideal. Yeah, so there's opportunities. Agenda item number one, which is the public works traffic comment. Okay, any issues with that? All right, so um, move on to agenda item four. And this is the This is the um, a continuing discussion from this committee to consider acquiring artwork. Right, Chair, uh, general public comment. Thank you. And that's my fault. <laughs> yeah. So um, we're going to open general public comment to members of the general public um, who would like to make um, comments on items of public interest that are within this committee's subject matter jurisdiction and that are not listed on tonight's agenda item. Um, are there any members of the public who'd like to make a public comment tonight? Did you receive any public comments before the meeting? And if so? Yes, we did receive one public comment. Okay. D yeah. David, did you want to sure. mention that Sure, it was one? Uh, sent along to the committee earlier this afternoon, and it was not pertinent to tonight's agenda. It was regarding the Black Lives Matter mural in front of the, uh, the library. So um, that's been uploaded to the website and passed along to the committee. Thank you. I would like to make one comment on that, having read that um, public comment in advance of the meeting. I look back at our records. Um, it was it had to do with the um, with the uh, Black Lives Matter Black Lives Matter mural that was done in 2020, and it, the question was whether it was being preserved or not. And it was it, the notion was potentially it was um, it showed a lack of care and consideration by not maintaining it. And I just wanted to pull from the staff report at that time the comment that said um, the mural will be temporary in that no sealant will be applied over the mural and the mural will not be maintained or repaired as part of this effort. Um, I don't think that reflects on the, the whole intention behind the city doing it in the first place or this body sponsoring it. So um, if the, uh, the person who made the comment or anyone else wants further information about that, about how the project came about, I think the staff report um, explain, at the time explains it really well, and also the city council's endorsement of the project. So they can go to contact our public art specialist, David Ward, for more information on that. Okay, if there are no other public comments, we'll close public comment. Yeah, um, did, you, did you fill out a, a card? Okay, come on up. Yeah, sure. Well, I was actually wondering what the comment was before the city said. It was just on the deterioration of the the mural itself, or excuse me, the uh, the street mural, I guess you can call it, and um, mm. it was just requesting uh, so the our body take a look and um, see what can be done. It was actually an, an inquiry to the library, who doesn't 
Yeah. It's not under the purview of the library, but it's in front of the library. Do we know who um, who's in charge of that mural that's at the library? I've seen that at the library. Well, again, to, I think to Christopher Smith's uh, comments, it was designed as uh, the project was a temporary mural. So yeah. the maintenance of it was uh, not to be you know maintained in that same oh, way that we would traditionally take care of a, a mural on a public building or something. Is there a date when that's going to be removed because it is temporary? Uh, I would have to look into that. I, I'm not familiar with those it terms. Seems way past due that that should be. I mean, I don't like it because it's right near the children's section and everything. It's like, you know, and I've researched Black Lives Matter. I don't know if you've looked into it at all, but it's pretty much a scam and a fraud. And I'm kind of embarrassed that the city would embrace it. And the police officers actually embrace it, too. It's on like the city website. So that's not why I came here to talk. I didn't even come here to talk about that, but it came up. So I'm um, voicing my opinion on that. Um, I'd like to see the mural come down uh, at the library. I don't think it's... Uh, Excuse me. Could you um, state your name for the record, please? Uh, Jason Barnett. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So that's it. Thanks. All right, with that, we'll close public comment. And we'll move on to... Now we'll move on to item four. This is the acquisition um, of the discussion continued discussion about the um, acquisition of pieces from Mary Fuller McChesney's estate. And tonight we have um, two representatives uh, that will be, take part in the discussion. Um, but first, I'd like to hand it over to public art specialist David Ward to give us a, uh, a staff report. Thank you. Um, so again, tonight, uh, we are continuing the discussion over proposed acquisitions for the Mary Fuller McChesney's estate. So th this item is from last month's meeting, which um, uh, back before tonight is uh, the staff recommendation to fund the artwork acquisition, installation, transportation and conservation amount set at $80,000 for council review and approval. This action does require uh, uh, a committee vote to recommend approval, and then it would go to council for that final approval of expenditure. And as noted in the staff reports item, tonight's uh, artwork selection discussion and location discussion is, is not contingent on that action, though I recommend a, a thorough discussion tonight to roughly outline and select artworks that the committee would like to acquire. And uh, as a note, we have uh, Gene Sinella and Dennis Kalabi are here to provide details about estate pricing that um, was given to the committee members uh, just before the meeting began and talk about some other details about availability and maybe other pertinent information that would help the committee uh, make those selections. I will also encourage discussion from the committee about locations for specific artworks, though, again, I want to clarify that in order to complete this action and move the item to council's review, um, the site locations and artwork selection isn't required. So um, that is, I hope that clarifies how we move forward through this item. So chair, I will turn the discussion over to you and uh, take any clarifying questions as well. Thank you. Great. So I thought we'd go about this by um, first uh, letting committee members ask the clarifying questions of staff, and then we'll um, go to public comment, and then we'll bring it back to a discussion um, that involves all of us and our guests tonight. Um, so the um, anyone, questions about the approach tonight, what the goals are that you, um, that you can ask David, or we can discuss briefly in advance, really process goals? Okay, great. So um, then we'll open general public comment. Does anyone have public comment on this specific agenda item? Seeing no comments, we'll close public comment and we'll open discussion on the matter. Um, I think it's important for us to, to, to really keep an eye on, to really appreciate how unique and somewhat complex this agenda item is if we let it become up complex because there's so many pieces out there, and until now, so many, there are so many unknowns. Um, I think the resources um, that Dennis and Jean bring tonight are gonna be invaluable to us, um, their history with the artist, but we're talking about acquiring lots of pieces or a number of pieces. We're talking about multiple sites, and we're talking about creating some sort of legacy for this artist in Petaluma to the best of our ability. 
So um, it's hard to, I think, keep all those things in mind, but really I think at the end of the day, what, we're, what I think we'd like to leave here with is some sort of an understanding of um, what, of, you saw the budget, the proposed budget, um, whether or not that's appropriate and whether we can send that forward. And really for you all, what you're willing to sort of um, bless as the expenditure on the pieces themselves, what percentage of that? And that to me is probably the, the most uh, highly negotiable part of this tonight. So um, with that in mind, let's, uh, I guess we could, um, if you're just, maybe we can t ask a few questions among ourselves or talk about it a little bit more to f get some clarification on some issues or um, to hear, sound out how other people are, do are doing, or, we, or if there's nothing to be said in that realm, then we can go directly to our guests and start asking questions of them. I have a question. Okay. Um, let's see. I'm just curious. I'm curious how the percentages of um, transportation, storage, and um, installation and conservation was calculated. Um, I'm just not sure if that's based on something similar that we've encountered or if it's um, or almost an industry standard. I'm not sure. How did that come about? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, again, from looking at other uh, public art installation contracts that were available publicly, and then other museum estimates as well, that's how those numbers were put together on top of um, just the volume, the sheer volume of artwork we're dealing with and the materials as well. So trying to look at rental prices for equipment that might be necessary. Um, I have a little bit of a background in that as well in operations and logistics for galleries. And so it was, I was trying to aggregate a, a, an average that would be appropriate with uh, a bit added on top um, for a contingency as well. So. Um, that will obviously fluctuate as we settle on how many works are required, how large they are, what the you know, installation requirements are. There's a lot of unknowns in there. Um, however, that I think that would build enough of a buffer that in the realm of what the committee has talked about of how many we're collecting, that would be an appropriate number to utilize. And again, I, I want to point out that in the staff report, uh, I noted twice in there that these are guideline numbers. So if we're talking, you know, if the guideline number is 15%, and it dips into 17, 20%, that's not, these aren't hard and fast, rigid numbers. It's just to use as a, as a guiding principle. So I hope that answers the question. Were there any other questions about really the budget allocation of the percentage breakdowns? If not, I'll, I'll reiterate something I've said in a few previous meetings um, that and I alluded to in the opening comments about this this sort of being the most, I think, negotiable part of it in my mind. Normally, I think we'd look at a, at a project very strictly and understand what it's going to cost from beginning to end, what it's going to take out of the public art fund. And I'm not saying not doing that here, but I'm saying it's pro I think we'd be wise to look at this opportunity for acquisition above all else at this point and realize that one way or another we'll be able to take care of some of the other um, costs associated with this a little bit down the road, either in conjunction with other bodies as um, um, cooperatively or just as later expenses for this committee. Okay, So I guess I'd say uh, err on the side of, uh, I don't know, I'd go a little bit higher than uh, than the percentage because if you break down that percentage out of out of what the staff report recommends for acquisition, it's definitely as low as I think any is way on the low side of the range that we've talked about so far. Okay. All right. So if there are no other comments, what I'd like to do is also um, is. Uh, convey uh, Chair Abercrombie's um, 
some, some of her wishes that she wanted to communicate at this meeting. And I think you've heard them before, um, but I think what it does is, is helps. She's done a really good job since she's looked at this work from the beginning of our sort of exploration here. And she's done a good job of identifying sites, themes, specific pieces, and creating a rationale for why, we, um, why she thinks certain pieces should be acquired. Um, and I think David Ward would have a list of those pieces, so I won't go into that. But um, just, to, just to form some context here, the locations and the reasoning behind the locations is, is what I'll share. Um, again, it's not all about location tonight, but that, play, that should play into it in all of our minds. Um, and east side roundabouts um, with priority on Corona Road, she says, for larger pieces and pieces um, that may show genitalia, okay? And she says that, I think, simply because of the um, maybe uh, vandalism prevention, okay? Somewhat removed from, from sort of immediate interaction. Um, two, Oak Hill Park. Here I would see bronze pieces of coyote, dancer, mother. Ideally, I would like to collect some smaller owls to put on poles here along the path. Three, um, the public library and garden, animal pieces, including the rabbit from the Astro Hotel. Wiseman Park, here I'd like to create a memorial pieces looking towards Sonoma Mountain, where the artist lived, potentially coyotes heads along the path. And five, City Hall, um, for the bust of the woman or potentially um, a piece by husband Mac um, of the Thunderbird. So does anyone have any uh, anything similar she'd like to share about locations or rationales, collections, themes that you've seen that you sort of like to latch on to? I just would add that I'm in agreement with all those things, and we, we flushed this out over the past few meetings. So um, I would agree with all those things that you mentioned. And um, just one clarification, the bust that, you, that we're talking about in City Hall, is that the, the former, the, the, her early artwork bust? I believe. Yeah, OK, thanks. I believe so. Yeah, I agree with everything that was said. Okay, great. So um, then Dennis um, and Jean, welcome. Hey, Dennis, it's great to see you. We heard that you've traveled a rough road of late, and so happy to have you here. And uh, maybe if, you just, if, you'd, if you'd step up to the microphone and so we can have a dialogue. Um, Okay, well, to clarify some things I wrote, um, all the pieces that were uh, chosen that are still on Sonoma Mountain are no longer available because um, the property is being sold with everything there. And um, many things... Um, occurred which made it impossible to remove everything but the hope is that uh, the place will be preserved as is and the art will be loved and there's a possibility depending on the buyer that some of the pieces may be um, you may be able to purchase from whoever the buyer is or God knows, even a donation. <laughs> if, for instance, the the large piece that Mary made uh, honoring her husband Mac, um, it's pretty personal, and really, I think, would have more meaning to the people of Petaluma than the buyer of the property. And I could see them 
letting go of that, but I haven't met the people, so I have no idea, but it's just conjecture. Will, will you just, as a representative of the estate be in contact with the buyer ultimately? Well, that's Jeannie is the representative of the estate, and uh, eventually I'm sure we'll all be introduced and connected, but uh, until the sale is made and we have discussions with the people, we have no idea, really. All, all we know is at this point, all those pieces are out of our hands. Yeah, I mean, neither of us have met the couple. Um, so, Dennis and I are hopeful. Gina. Oh, Dennis and I are very hopeful that down the road they'll be willing to part with, you know, I mean, your reasons for wanting them and, and the whole, you know, I spoke to Melissa before she left and it was very eloquent. And I think, you know, that might get them <laughs> to the place where they might release some of them. So I hope so. That's encouraging. I think yeah. this is this is a little bit yeah. of a curveball, knowing that um, I think we, we probably put our collections together in our mind much, you know, based on what we saw yeah. there. So this is um, it makes it somewhat more complicated, but at the same time, it relieves us of the uh, of numbers anyway. If I mean it. <laughs> so what I might ask then is that they, is that um, we ask David Ward um, to stay in touch with you. Um, and to hopefully connect with the buyer of the estate to see um, yes. and to carry on that conversation. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, I think I pointed out um, there's some discrepancy in um, the prices of the pieces that are being stored at Jeannie's place in my house and in my the gallery are different from the ones at the Astro because we have to pay uh, a significant commission to the Astro people uh, whether we make the sale or they find a buyer. So, for instance, the two bronze coyotes are priced differently for that reason because um, there's that discrepancy in our cost. I'm just taking a but moment to ev read this. Everything has been steeply discounted. And the pieces, other than the Astro, um, there could be some negotiation um, to reduce prices somewhat, if necessary. Right. Well, my guess is that the, that the numbers corresponding to the prices probably don't mean much to us as we look at them now. Um, so I oh, the numbers correspond to the uh, email that David sent with, with the photographs. So they're your numbers. Yes. And I, I assumed yeah. you'd all have it up on your screens. We, I don't, we especially can, in my current condition do not have the wherewithal to figure out how to attach little pictures. Oh, no problem at all. Price and, list. and we can certainly look at images tonight uh, if we would like to. Um, that's that's up to the committee. Um, the numbering was, and the this nomenclature was just, we needed to be able to talk about specific works without knowing the names of them. So we had to find a way to do that no, quickly. That was perfect. Yeah. yeah. And so um, I hope that uh, is still sensitive to Mary's work and not uh, doling it down to just numbers oh, and figures. No, I, I think it's fine. And since most are untitled, how else could you do it? Yeah. Can I take a moment then to, uh, while you say most are untitled, to ask a few questions just so you can clear up a few things? I wanted to know what um, you do, how, how um, 
if we were to acquire them, what we do about titling and about attributions throughout, you know, based on where they're left. Is that something you can get back to us about? Um, we can always put the artist name on it. Well, but if you are dating titled and a few, there's a number of others that I know Mary's colloquial descriptions of, but very few have a formal title. So they can be described, for instance, the two tall bronze coyotes are titled uh, Coyote Goddess and Her Birds. But most are not that formal and complete. Okay. Thank you. And as it stands now, nothing at the Sonoma Mountain Estate is, is, is available, but everything at your residences and at the Astro Motel that is not hasn't already been sold is, is available. All are available. Okay. And there's also uh, more pieces uh, at my gallery, which the committee didn't come to see. And... There's only, well, there's one more of the coyotes. And uh, the snake goddess that uh, the public might not like. <laughs> there's um, a woman pleasuring herself with a little help from her snake. And it's a great work of art, but uh, I can imagine there could be some negative public commentary. Um, and then some small pieces, which I don't think are appropriate for public display because they're too easy to steal. So that leads me to one, for me, very important comment, um, that other than the bronzes, uh, most of the pieces are built in pieces that are set over a central pipe. And in some place like a turnabout, um, it'd be too easy for someone to lift off the head and run away with it. And then what do you have? A, a headless sculpture. So I think most of them really need to be in somewhat secure places and not just out in the middle of nowhere. Thank you for that. I think it's some, that's something that you know we occurred to us, but we weren't sure of, or we've been able to sort of gloss over a little bit in the excitement of understanding. So. On the other hand, um, when you consult with an objects conservator in terms of cleaning, and most pieces are in good condition, but really need to be cleaned and sealed of the concrete pieces. And um, so I can recommend people or you can find your own, but um, my thought would be that to consult with that person or persons on the possibility of um, some reversible system of locking the pieces together um, so that no one could lift off the top pieces that all be attached and fused together. But I'm a paintings conservator, so the, the basic tenets of conservation are the same across mediums and uh, materials. And one of the classics is that everything you do should be reversible. So it either need to be some sort of um, metal armature that keeps it all together, or if it's an adhesive, it has to be one that's reversible with the appropriate solvent rather than something that's forever, which often goes contrary to practical solutions. <laughs> but it's probably, it should certainly be doable. Committee members, anything um, that you'd like to add?
I had a question on the document you gave us, David, about it says the bench we were interested in is no longer available, but Dennis's letter said there is one that's more elaborate and interesting. Do you have that oh. photograph? I can give you some photos. Right, and so the only information I was able to give to Dennis and Jean prior to this meeting was everything that we've all looked at together. So I don't have any additional information except okay. for what Dennis can share with us tonight. And okay. this document was only given to me at the same time oh, as okay. all of you. So hopefully we'll we'll be able to pass around these photos here okay. in a second. are okay. two different benches and the and close-ups on the side there. Okay, and that one is being stored on my patio but was moved after you and the other people came to to look. So and, and would you mind just for the public record describing what these of these images are just so when we look back at this meeting we know everybody knows what we're looking at as well. Um, creatures. <laughs> yeah, cre creatures on the bench. <laughs> Thank you. And you'll notice that um, one of them on the right side is missing its lower jaw, which uh, Mary bought those mouthpieces with the teeth and the eyes at um, well, with my brain injury, I'm forgetting words, but oh, taxidermist supply house. So um, they should be replaceable, and any good objects conservator would be able to uh, replace them and maybe patinate them to match the other side. Dennis, I have a question, if you may. Sure. The bench that you just showed us in the photos, is I don't imagine that that's listed here. No. Can you um, update this list with pricing to include that at some point? Sure. Just And then my other question, I just wanted to clarify that what's listed on your handout encompasses all of the artworks that are for sale. Oh, there's many more okay, for sale. So They're the, the ones, ones that we were selected got, by the okay. committee. Thank you. And could we get a price on that bench now if you have it, just so then we're all... Um, or not? We, we had talked about 6000 but given the repair needed and all... I would say five would be fine, if that's okay with you. Yes. It's really a cool piece. And since it's stored on my patio, part of my recovery from my brain injury was sitting on the bench in the sun for an hour every day. <laughs> and I've fallen deeply in love with it. So. <laughs> Um, if my ship ever comes in and you guys don't go for it, I may buy it for me. <laughs> One of the filters we were running these pieces through in our minds was the, um, we were trying to edit out the foam based ones. Um, yeah, and the, none of these. Okay. The one that was still on the mountain that's no longer available had the foam and I personally consider them um, beyond being a conservation nightmare, um, not Mary's best. It, you know, the late works where she was aging and finding ways to do shortcuts. So um, it's not, those aren't what I would consider her class pieces. Great. We're on the right track then. So um, on, and at the Astro Motel, none of those pieces 
um, are foam based? No, okay. none of them. All either concrete except for the few um, uh, bronzes. Okay. Further questions? No. Without further questions, I have a. Um, I'm sort of putting together in my mind a way forward, and I, I guess I'd put it out there that as um, particularly because so much of the you know, sort of the the collections in my mind have changed now, editing out the, with the work at Sonoma Mountain. I would like to. Um, I what I'd like to suggest is that we have a ad hoc subcommittee that can take responsibility for the selection of, this product, of the of the pieces and work with city staff, Gene and Dennis, and then come back to this committee with a recommendation. Does that sound sound reasonable? I know you can't be yeah, I think that I think that makes a lot of sense because the landscape has changed. So I mean, they're all still um, it's an amazing body of work, but it wasn't what I was visualizing talking about tonight. So I need to even just refresh myself with with all of these things that we chose and you know see what they are. I mean, I think our numbers are probably still quite satisfactory. Um, in terms of requesting city, you know, council approval, but I'd like to—I agree with you, um, Christopher—that we should do a little recap together. I just had a quick, quick note um, that if we do create an ad hoc committee tonight, we should keep it to two members just to respect the quorum and Ali's departure. So that's it. All right. Thank you for that. Um, if since that's agreeable, what I'd like to do then is, without her being present, nominate the uh, the problem our our committee chair. Um, she can always back out of that, um, but I think she would value greatly being being part of this. Um, and if is there any dissent there? Does anyone really get bummed out by me putting? Okay. All right. And then would would someone else like to join the subcommittee? Someone who feels like they... uh, I I don't really serve on ad hocs, but I'll I'll be your staff support and I I will be happily joining you for outings and whatnot that I'm invited to. I'm doing a integrated pest management ad hoc right now that I feel like is um, going to take a lot of time for Parks and Rec, so I have to bow out of this one. Thank you. Keeping Good luck with the integrated pest room. management. <laughs> All right. All right. We'll look in this direction then, um, or at me, but uh, I'm happy to... Um, I'd, I'd be delighted to sort of see the results of, a, of someone else working on this and and uh, really endorse it because I, I don't feel, uh, I feel there are a lot of great solutions in here, but um, if, would, would either of you like to, to work on that? And if not, I will. I'd be happy to work on this with Melissa. Wonderful, we have an ad hoc subcommittee, committee member Diggs and Chair Abercrombie. And I would be happy to um, give whatever assistance needed um, in, you know, figuring things out, um, questions about pieces. And uh, one comment would be that while professional art handlers can do excellent work, that uh, a lot of the same work could be done by certain highly skilled laborers for a tiny fraction of the cost. And um, I would certainly consider that, because otherwise the costs could skyrocket. Although for the actual work on the objects, uh, I definitely vote for using totally uh, top-of-the-line conservators because 
treatment of objects can really go south if it's not someone properly equipped to do it. Thank you for saying that. I think that, that means a lot coming from you. Um, that The first part of what you said is what my I had in my gut, and that's why I was so rec- that's why I was recommending we're a little bit loose on some of those added expenses because I think we can save on that or get cooperative engagement from other people to maybe do some of the yeah yes, and names and phone numbers great yeah, yeah um, and I'm in contact with one who I'm going to be engaging to work on some of the pieces in my care and so. Once she comes up to look, I'll have a better idea of um, costs and what proper treatment would be. You know, Mario's advocated uh, cleaning and uh, recoding with Thompson's water seal every two years. And there have been huge advances in the last 10 years on concrete conservation, whether it's a building or an object. And there's probably much better ways to go now. So we'll see. Thank you. Um, If there are no other comments or questions for our guests, then um, what I'd like to do is is move on to um, the discussion around the the budget itself that that we'd like to request from city council. Okay. Um, Actually, I do have one thing that just came up for me. Um, Dennis, just looking at your list here that you put together for us, are any of these, do you feel time sensitive in terms well, of Well, that was going to be around? my next question is that uh, everything is for sale and both the trust and I are in need of funds, but if you could sooner rather than later come up with a list of faves, we would take them off the market. Um, And part of it is, I don't know what your timeline is, but sometime this summer I'm planning, this was actually planned for last fall, but it never happened due to many circumstances, but I want to have a major memorial and celebration of Mary's life at the gallery and bring as many pieces as it will fit to my gallery. And then the walls would all be hung with Robert's work. And since I am theoretically a for-profit gallery, I would want the pieces there to be for sale. And so if we knew in advance which pieces you most strongly favor, Mm -hmm. I would keep those out of the show. So no formal commitment, but just um, give me an idea. Great. Well, thank you for coming here tonight, and um, welcome back to the land of the healthy. Hope you thank continue you. recovering. Yeah, basically, um, as a week ago, those first given permission by the doctors to get out of the house and to look at a computer and watch TV. I mean, I, I wasn't even supposed to read books, and. It's an incredible liberation, but I'm, I'm still pretty fuzzy in my head. And, you know, at, like compiling this list took me a week because if I think seriously, my brain gets tired. So I'm nowhere near 100%, but just being able to walk around and talk is great. So thank you for that. Yeah. And Jeannie? Sure. Support and all of that. Jean, Jean, we'll um, we'll be in touch. Hopefully, to to keep the the line of communication going between you and the the buyers of the the property, and then um, 
collectively, you'll hear from our ad hoc, from Melissa and uh, and. I hear something before I hear from you. You will hear. Thank you. Okay. Also, if you want to hold on to these photos of the bench, you're welcome to them. Sure, we can. I only made one set. We can make digital copies of those too, sure. <laughs> and I can I can upload those to our our Dropbox that we've been working with. So going to the um, staff report um, and the recommendation for uh, allocating a total of eighty thousand dollars for this project, which includes a percentage of that for acquisitions. Um, we can open that to discussion, or if that's if you'll take staff's recommendation, we can move to approve that. Well, I, I do have a question. So, out of the eighty thousand, if we go by those guidelines, that would actually only be about thirty-two thousand for acquisition. I mean, if we could bump it up to 50%, that's still 40,000. So, um, like I just did a quick calculation here of the letter, that's around 95,000. So, um, thank you for putting that in perspective. <laughs> and I did the quick math when I saw that list and quickly realized that, you know, we would bust right through that. So we're certainly not going to get everything we right, want. Right, right. I mean, we if might we get half. bench, which I love, the, that bench we just saw, that's over 100000 So, um, yeah, we're going to have to parse this a little more. Yeah. You're, and I don't want to encourage irresponsible sort of spending of the public art fund here, but I do think that being a little bit generous in this realm or just thinking optimistically <laughs> um, is, uh, I think, would serve us well in, in the long term here. Right. So, but really what we're at about is deciding what that, uh, what we're going to request as a overall budget allocation um, to be approved by city council. So relative to the 80,000 that staff has recommended, do we have any other, um, would you like to go up, down, or stay right, right there? Uh, well, if I could ask David a question, where did I know we talked about sixty to eighty? So did you go with eighty because that was the higher amount, or was there? Yeah, and so again, it, I think it's noted in the staff report that any amount, if if this whole project ends up for, um, um, you know, just to to imagine, if it costs us sixty five thousand dollars to do this whole project, at least the earmarked amount in the budget that is committed towards this project was 80 and right. any unspent funding, including the contingency number that was baked into that, those estimates will all be returned back to the public art fund. So in theory, if we committed say $110,000 to this entire project to get more works, which would also raise the cost of transportation, conservation, and all those other buckets that we looked at, um, any unspent funds, again, would go back to the public art fund. Um, and I also wanted to point out one other item on here that was nearly impossible to try to bake into these estimates was staff time. So it, it's, again, I don't see this as an ongoing project for years and years and years. Um, however, there will be, you know, this, these are invoice numbers that we're talking about, contracting services for art handling, for transportation, for conservation, and the actual sticker price of acquisition. So I just wanted to be um, extra squeaky clear about <laughs> what what numbers we're talking about. And David, can you remind us what is available right now in the fund? Um, I can pull up here um, our last Q2 right. budget. Um, right. It's just take me a moment. Great. I just realized with all the stuff I brought for tonight, I don't have the budget. <laughs> Dennis and Jean, if you, I don't think we have any further questions for you. So, um, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, it's yeah. time for me to lay down. <laughs> so, I appreciate you being you here. Yeah. Yeah, nice yeah. to meet you. Thank you both for being here. And I'll be talking to you. Yeah. Yes, we'll we'll be in touch. All right. Yeah. Take care Thank and, you so much. and drive safely. Um, Cheryl, the last time that we looked at the ending balance at Q2 was three, $376,000 and some change. 
and uh, we are expecting some income in the next quarter as well. So um, I'm also, I can bring up the committed funds if you yeah, wanted me to. Yeah, that's the other part. So this is the total and then what's already committed. Yeah, I was just going to add. Right. Um, let's see. Including 80,000 towards this would put us at, I, I think, roughly two, 200 and Two hundred and sixty-five thousand dollars out of that that total number, and again, these are these are rough cut numbers, um, and some of these things have wrapped up a little bit more. Um, or see, even there, I made a mistake. Sorry, I was reading too quickly. So we have remaining remaining project amounts at one hundred and sixty-three thousand dollars. So that's what's committed out of the three hundred and seventy-six and and change. So about 163 is still available? Roughly. Okay, right, roughly. Okay. I don't know. I'd like to entertain. Maybe we go up closer to 100,000 instead of 80,000. But I also am very conscious this is other people's money, so to speak. So um, I want to be very careful with our decisions. I concur with you, Cheryl. I was thinking along the same lines. If knowing that any unused funds goes right back into the right. the public arts fund, that gives me great comfort. And I would rather have the bandwidth to do this properly. Yeah. I mean, if we're looking at the cost of these items, there are 17 items on this list. If we stick at a at a 40% purchase, that allows us maybe five pieces, generally. And I think our intent was to get at least a dozen. So granted, that's a generalization. You know, some of the pieces are 10, 13,000, some of them are 450. But I think to do what we want to do, um, 80,000 is not going to get us there with proper conservation and installation. So I would agree. I would, I would like to see um, the amount raised to 100,000. Okay. And hearing that, Cheryl, do you, um, does, that, does that figure feel better for you more solid yeah okay. yeah definitely all right well there seems to be gentleman sentiment to, to raise the allocation so i don't even like to um uh, make a motion to approve that expenditure so i'll make a motion um and you'll have to help me craft this sentence properly but that we go forward to city council with the idea of setting aside $100,000 for the acquisition of an unknown number of pieces from Mary uh, Fuller McChesney. Yeah, no, that, that sounded pretty good to me. Recommend, okay. so I'll, I'll see if I can summarize. So rec the committee Moving forward with recommending $100,000 to fund artwork acquisitions from the Mary Fuller McChesney estate and contract for artwork installation, transportation, conservation for city council approval. Does that sound like a good summary? Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. I'll second that. Okay, I'll do a roll call vote. Abercrombie, absent. Cold Iron? Yes. Smith? Yes. Sponger? Yes. Diggs? Yes. Rizzo Simmons? Yes. I think we have all yeses, one absent. Do you like everybody? One and one vacancy. Thank you. David, so then when will this go to the city council? Will it be the very next month, or do we have to wait several yes. months to get on the agenda? That's a great question. So to talk about next steps generally, and I can't speak for what council's agendas look like. Um, I would probably say it's we can expect to get in in the next month or two to get on an agenda. That shouldn't stop the ad hoc committee that was formed tonight from doing any work and earmarking some of those works that we can get off the market. So I would recommend the ad hoc committee uh, jump on work as, as soon as possible to really filter through that, you know, come back to this committee again at the next meeting and say, here are, here's the 
what we think are the most solid selection, and here's what the numbers shake out to look like. Um, and then, you know, we're in the queue to go to council. And again, we don't need to have um, artwork selected or location selected when we go to council um, because that recommendation was made tonight. But um, we should definitely uh, have the specific artworks looked at and just so we can get them off the market. And I, you know, I think it's pretty safe to say that those, you know, the commit, I don't want to speak on behalf of council, but um, I, I don't anticipate them blocking, you know, uh, a recommendation to collect artwork. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's just, it's an expenditure. So I would be pretty shocked if that happened. So, yeah. Okay, with that, we'll close out that agenda item. And um, David, I'd like you to stop me if procedurally this is inappropriate, but I'd like to, to ask the committee if they have um, an issue with adjusting our agenda yet again because uh, and putting the, what was going to be the next agenda item, which was number five, um, behind what is the original agenda item, number one, because the presenter of that is now here. Any problems with that? Procedurally, we're okay with that? It's your meeting chair, so yeah. Okay. It all makes sense to me. Let's do that. All right, so we'll move on. We'll move on to the original agenda item number one. Um, you can either go to the podium. We have a microphone here. Um, it's it's yeah, to you. Right, and um, just bear with me while I'm pulling up Bjorn's presentation. But today we have we have Bjorn, um, active transportation planner. I hope I have your title right <laughs> from Public Works and Utilities, and uh, he's here to speak to us uh, about upcoming opportunities to work with Public Works and the Public Art Program to collaborate on traffic calming and road improvement projects. So we're going to be speaking at a high level to introduce uh, what this can more or less look like. So um, let me pull this up. Thanks, David. Um, good evening, committee members. Uh, my name is Bjorn Griebenberg. I'm a project manager with uh, Public Works and Utilities. My title is not active transportation <laughs> planner, but I am sort of the de facto active transportation planner. Um, I'm actually the uh, the staff liaison to the pedestrian and bicycle advisory committee. So that's um, generally my area of emphasis, although with everything going on in public works, we get pulled in a lot of different directions. Um, and I'll just, uh, I know David's queuing it up here. Um, so really happy to be here tonight, looking forward to this discussion. Um, and you can go ahead and, and go to the next slide. Thanks. So uh, our, my, my personal goal here tonight, and I've, I've coordinated quite a bit with David, is really just to um, introduce this topic uh, to you all um, around the opportunities uh, that we are seeing to begin incorporating public art in some of our um, road improvement projects, more specifically projects that um, deal with traffic calming or other uh, safe streets elements. Um, so we what would be really helpful tonight is just, um, again, like David said, have a high level discussion about um, uh, the topic, discuss potential roles and, uh, and, and the process. Um, really nothing is set in stone. So this is a very open discussion and then identify next steps towards formalizing uh, this process. So as um, some of you may have noticed, we've, uh, there's definitely uh, an emphasis on safe streets in Petaluma. Council actually made it one of their top 10 uh, goals uh, to improve safety on our streets for all road users. And um, we've adopted several plans and policies around improving safety, um, notably including uh, a commitment to Vision Zero, which means uh, we are working to eliminate all uh, deaths and severe injuries resulting from traffic collisions by 2030. And um, we see uh, these small, smaller um, traffic calming projects like you see in front of you as a, as a key way to achieve that goal. Um, so I actually can back up one step. I'll just describe um, sort of uh, what our current approach is. So uh, these are two examples of, of recent traffic calming projects. Um, on the left there, that's a, what we call a bulb out. Um, that's over near Loma Vista Immersion Academy at Monroe, and, Monroe Street and Tahola Lane. Um, the purpose of those is really to 
um, shorten the pedestrian crossing distance, put them out in a more visible location um, so that drivers can see them more easily. You're not peeking around a, a parked car and, you know, taking your life into your hands uh, while, when stepping out into the street to cross the street. Um, and they also slow uh, vehicle driver turning movements. Um, so that's that was a what we call a quick build project that we did. Um, it was requested by folks in the neighborhood. And um, so we we're able to design and install these pretty quickly just using paint and other um, elements that we can mount directly in the asphalt. Um, you can see that we used the, the parking blocks there. And we also took the stop sign actually off of the sidewalk and moved it out into a more visible location in the street. Um, and then on the right there is the, uh, the new traffic circle at Upham and Bassett right outside here. Um, again, that was initiated by a, a neighborhood request um, related uh, largely to high school um, cut through traffic in the neighborhood. And we actually observed speeds on, um, uh, on Bassett Street up to, uh, I believe, 60 miles an hour, which is hard to believe. That's a street with a 25 mile an hour speed limit. And so the goal with the traffic circle is just to add something, put something out on the roadway that makes drivers slow down and um, and it's uh, proven to be a, a really uh, effective solution. Um, right now, we're hearing from neighborhood groups all over the city. Everyone, every neighborhood uh, is observing a, a speeding issue, and they, everyone wants more and more um, uh, traffic calming uh, elements in their neighborhoods. So we're actually formalizing a process through which um, neighborhoods would be able to nominate certain locations where they're seeing speeding or other safety issues. Um, we would then score them. We're developing some criteria to score these projects because we're getting so many requests and then implement several of them on an annual basis. And um, again, those are kind of neighborhood initiated spot improvements. We also have larger corridor projects like the uh, Fifth Street Neighborhood Greenway. That's a project that will um, go from Western all the way to uh, Mountain View. So a pretty long project that will include um, lots and lots of bulb outs, traffic circles, chicanes, other traffic calming elements throughout the project, throughout the corridor. So, um, uh, yeah, it's just a, it's, it's an exciting time to be, um, involved in all of these efforts. Um, we are hearing from the public that, uh, these quick build installations are not very, um, <laughs> There, the, the aesthetics could be improved, right? Um, you look, you look at that at those two examples. You see a lot of striping um, signage. Uh, a lot of them also we use those plastic delineators. You know, those are not the most um, uh, attractive. We, we understand that, and so especially in um, in the more residential areas, we hear about concerns of just the the aesthetic impacts of these um, traffic calming devices. All right, I think I'm finally ready for you to go to the next slide. <laughs> um, but there is a great opportunity that we're seeing, and that's um, uh, the opportunity to install artwork in some of these spaces that we are uh, beginning to carve out. So these are two um, pretty recent examples from a bike boulevard project down in Redwood City, very similar uh, in nature to what we're looking to do on Fifth Street, um, where they were able to install murals within the traffic circles. And we've actually talked about um, uh, trying to do that out here at Upham and Bassett. Um, and that's, that was one of some, the inspiration partially for, for me coming to you tonight to introduce this topic is just realizing we don't really have a process worked out um, to, to make this happen. Can go to the next slide. A couple more examples. Um, so on the left there, that's a, an on-street bike corral in San Francisco. So we actually just received... Um, direction from uh, or feedback from the Pedestrian Bicycle Advisory Committee and the Historic and, Pres uh, Historic and Cultural Preservation Committee um, that they'd like us to, they'd like to see us uh, prioritize on-street bike corrals in the downtown area. And so that's where we actually basically push um, the bike parking and take it off the sidewalk, put it out into the roadway in the space that's typically occupied by parked cars. And you can see there in San Francisco, they um, they actually, it was a great place to install a mural. It's a very popular project. Um, and then on the right there, um, those are some quick build bulb outs, similar to what I showed at over on um, Monroe Street, and that's up in Portland. And just two more examples. Um, 
both showing bull bouts. Uh, so you can see on the left there, Kansas City, uh, a really uh, cool design um, where they really significantly shrunk the size of the intersection down. You can see that's a big reason that we have a lot of speeding issues is because streets are just so overbuilt. Um, we have a lot more real estate on our streets than we really need to move traffic. And the wider streets are, the wider intersections are, um, that facilitates those um, sweeping, turning movements and, and just faster speeds where um, drivers feel more comfortable um, or, or are just are, can drive less cautiously. Um, and then uh, and then another bulb out there on the right up in Seattle. Um, really, the point of these is to just to, again, like I said, slow turning movements, shorten pedestrian crossing distances. So they're very effective. Um, there was a recent study done that showed that um, uh, the addition of artwork within these um, traffic calming features um, has additional safety benefits beyond the features themselves. So there was a, an estimate that they reduce crashes by an additional 50% on top of what's sort of already being done out there. Um, and so just a lot of promising evidence that not only do these enhance sense of place, uh, beautify the community, but they also are serving an important role in improving safety. So now turning to the potential roles and process. And again, this is very open-ended, open to discussion and feedback. Um, uh, David and I have had some preliminary discussions and um, this is sort of generally what we've, what, where we landed. Um, public works and utilities, our, our primary responsibility would be to identify existing opportunities. We'll basically inventory and map all of the places that we've got these traffic calming features installed, but also coordinate closely with David on upcoming opportunities. So the Fifth Street Neighborhood Greenway being a great example where we have a project that's in the design process uh, where we know we will have several traffic calming features and it's a great opportunity to um, think about incorporating art before it's even installed potentially. And then um, second, um, you know, handling the artist solicitation, the design review, the public engagement associated with the art artwork, um, which is really, we feel out, outside of our wheelhouse in public works and probably in yours. And then lastly, um, the installation. So um, from what I've seen in, in other cities, there are a lot of cases where uh, artwork is actually installed by the same contractor that's doing the, the roadway improvements. Um, those, they're very, very, the, the people who uh, lay down roadway markings are um, incredibly talented in in just their precision and being able to figure out um, ways to uh, produce different designs. So that's one option. Um, you know, if with guidance from Public Works, we can also we'd also be happy to consider having artists and and even community members make the installations themselves. Of course, with some maybe additional guidance on materials selection. Um, traffic control, uh, compatibility with, you know, with the other, with the traffic control features, you know, the signage, the markings, et cetera. But, um, uh, so there's some, there's definitely some, uh, flexibility there potentially. And then next slide, just a few questions and follow-up items potentially to guide the conversation tonight. Um, really the, the biggest thing, what role would you all like to play? what's the best way to engage and involve community members in the design and installation process. So we know um, based on what we've heard from folks on Fifth Street and even here with Upham and Bassett, um, you know, and I'm sure you won't be surprised to hear this, but people who live in the neighborhood, they want to have uh, ownership on these projects. And in many cases, we're hearing from people saying like, how can I get involved? Can I paint a mural? Can I design and paint a mural myself? And, um, you know, we don't have a, a great answer to that right now. Um, and then uh, the question I just alluded to on the last slide of who can or should install the artwork. Um, and then lastly, funding. Um, and that's something that, that David and I really haven't covered yet, but um, another area where um, just we need to do some, uh, have additional discussion and, and do some more follow-up. And that's, oh, and then a couple of resources here linked. So once the PDF is posted to the agenda, I can check out a couple of, um, a couple of resources related to street art. All right, that's everything I have. Thank you, Bjorn. So thank you. So I have a, a bunch of things to say on this topic. I'd love to have a good discussion about this. So, um, but 
who's ready for questions or, or do you comments? mind if I I just wanted oh, to yeah. also just uh, to some of the preliminary conversations that Bjorn uh, alluded to which was we tried to not drill down all the way to figuring out every single element of things because we understand that there's a lot of different ways that this body can be a part of this it can be a minimal you know review and approval well not necessarily approval but you know review and feedback kind of position or it can be project management or we could get into contract with somebody like amanda lynn who has experience with art education and get involved with the phoenix um, teens and um you know local schools and make this a, a bigger program that we we could run as a public art program so there are hundreds of ways that we could do this so i just wanted to make sure that we broke this conversation really far open and again uh bjorn and i will will as things start to as certain projects start to come up and surface we will we will talk about those timelines we'll talk about those budgets um and uh, I just wanted to make sure that we're keeping the, the discussion really, really high level and, um, and open. Thank you. Any questions for Bjorn Griepenberg? I just think like the materials and the paint used is gonna be a huge, I mean, we've all seen the, the crosswalk on Kentucky. It's basically not there. It's been what, four months, five months? So I don't know if these other cities are using the striping paint that the that road crews use, which would make sense. Um, yeah, yeah, and actually, if I could just comment on that really quickly. Um, so uh, I believe the crosswalk on Kentucky Street was probably done uh, with the latex paint. And, and that's really the latex paint has an extremely short lifespan um, when it is exposed to a lot of vehicle traffic, which that crosswalk is. And that's why we're seeing the wear. Um, and uh, so anything within the roadway, we would probably lean towards what's called thermoplastic. That's the, the heavy duty um, markings that you see on most many of our streets. Um, but those are actually, um, so we would, those would have to be professionally installed if they're out in the roadway. Um, the, the areas we're identifying, which, you know, are protected by traffic circles or within bulb outs, they're not going to see that same level of traffic. So we might be able to use a latex paint, which kind of opens it back up to who can install it um, and uh, and the use of uh, obviously a much um, cheaper and, and easier uh, material to work with. Sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I appreciate you bringing it to the art committee um, because I think this is the great, you know, we could be the really a, a great bridge between public works and, you know, the community. Um, there are so many iterations that we could um, see happening. I, I envision, you know, schools and lots of people would want to get involved with this um, because it's it's hyper local. You know, it's it's um, it's a really great opportunity for people to own the artwork in their own neighborhood. And that's usually not the case. So I, I applaud you guys for being open to this. Um, and then I guess there are more specific things. I'm just curious. I would imagine that the striping lines in a bulb out are intentional to signal to a driver, don't you know encroach. When you paint over that, does that mitigate that or does it lessen the impact or is it something that you is there like a, a break-in period that the public has to get used to the streets and then you can say, okay, we'll paint over the lines or? Yeah, that, that's a great question. What we've discussed is um, in order to make these more compatible with artwork in the future, basically outlining them with thermoplastic, um, right? Having our contractor install that and then leaving them basically blank. But we'd have to have some sort of, um, or ideally we would have some sort of vertical edge treatment. So you saw the parking blocks um, in the examples from a couple of the other examples I showed, they use um, those white delineator, plastic delineators. So um, we can we can definitely leave the spaces blank uh, in anticipation of um, of art installation. Some committee members may recall um, a couple times over the last half year or so I've, I've mentioned this, um, this project or something along these lines and pointed us 
a reference that Bloomberg Philanthropies um, effort that's really that Bjorn is linked to. And I'd encourage you to go and take a look at that because the numbers um, of the study that were done in 2022 that looked at the 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 result of that on um, on traffic injuries and fatalities is like it's just is pretty and pedestrian fatality is pretty stunning and it's it's very persuasive so I'm totally sold on the whole idea of this and I think there um, I think if you if I think there are a lot of people around town who are going to be not only sympathetic with the whole idea, but will want to get involved. So that's a question I think we could tackle here in terms of process. But um, you could, in, in a preliminary sense, what I sort of thought of is you use the word wheelhouse, what's in your wheelhouse and what's not. And I think we don't particularly have a strong wheelhouse. We sort of swing all over the place. It seems like, but we're. Um, but I think what we we do have a little bit of experience in now is well, like with the Black Lives Matter mural, we can use things like that as a template for being able to say, um, for having city staff be able to set up this body to be able to then coordinate artists in whatever form we we feel is appropriate to come in and do the work. So I was thinking that that public the breakdown would be something along the lines of um, public works doing all the legwork, um, the materials research, things like that, being super clear about what the, the thermoplastic, like what colors does that come in? What are the, basically create a design brief for someone who would, would, come, in to, who would come into it um, and would actually do the painting um, be it a community member or a professional artist, um, do all the sourcing, the scheduling, keeping um, the permitting, all the technical production things, basically having someone there to solve those problems. So to be that awesome helping hand that this body is always looking for when we're doing projects in the city. Um, and then, um, then uh, really having the artists be... Um, being, uh, I guess, our responsibility to somehow figure a way of, of equitably serving the community and getting the best artwork out there too for these sites. I guess that that's what, and then um, using our staff liaison to coordinate the sort of the execution, getting on the ground with the artists and being able to to support them um, alongside your staff. Um, I had one other item. Oh yeah, I think it's about the the bulb outs. Um, right now, you you I think you you drew attention to the fact that a lot of them are executed as if here are the tools that a traffic engineer has to make a to make a traffic calming device, and that's what someone sees. There's I think there's so much more that can be done. You probably think the same, but who would who would be that person? Who what would be that entity? Is the, um, some of your traffic consultants, do they have some sort of a design element in there that can bring best sort of imaginative, most creative practices, all of those Kansas City bulb outs that have the unique, very pronounced shapes that are, mm -hmm. that, that direct the traffic appropriately, but also give really an inspired canvas, okay? Yeah. Does that exist? Y yeah, so we are really... Um trying to well right now we're trying to establish basically a traffic calming toolkit um so we've got a few standard treatments that we've developed you know between the bulb outs and the traffic circle um we're currently looking at developing uh chicanes which are um they're really hard to describe without showing a visual but it's basically imagine bulb outs placed almost mid-block and staggered from each other so that traffic basically is narrowed to one lane in both directions and then kind of has to navigate through, uh, uh, through a series of turns, um, or meanders, I should say. Um, like Berkeley has been doing for like, yeah, yeah. 50 years. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, we are expanding our toolkit, um, you know, with, with regard to the geometry of these, uh, everything has to be compatible with, um, you know, different vehicle types, depending on the street, right? So we'd have to look at the turning movements of fire trucks and some in most locations or, or larger vehicles. Um, that being said, we are really trying to 
do our best to carve out as much space as possible to slow those turning movements and really make a, a meaningful impact on the safety. Um, so I don't have a, uh, I mean, that's really the best answer I can give. Our, our toolkit is, is in development and it's growing. <laughs> so hopefully some more inspired canvases are on the way. <laughs> Great. Yeah. So ultimately I think if, if you get, if you have an inspired canvas and a series of them and you have that, that brief and that comes to us and we're able to supply the artistic talent or figure it out a way, best way to get it on site. That's the, um, then their job becomes our job and their job becomes a lot easier. Very well directed. Yeah. Yeah. And then I also had a question. I mean, it also comes down to time and volume, right? What is your sort of projected volume on these projects in terms of, you know, over the next six months or a year, are we looking at floor bulbs out or, you know, 80, I, I <laughs> surely not 80, but, you know, because um, we are a small body and we won't, we're shrinking as of t tomorrow and hopefully growing again in June. But, um, you know, that's, we have a full plate and I think this is a great project for us. I just want to make sure that we manage the incoming ask appropriately. Yeah. So we, uh, we're definitely ramping up. Um, we're, we're kind of establishing all of the systems and processes on our end um, to really uh, start delivering these um, uh, faster and uh, with and just in greater quantity. So the Fifth Street project alone, um, the current proposal includes up to three traffic circles, bulb outs at basically every intersection. <laughs> couple of mid-block chicanes. So um, uh, the there will be a lot of volume. Um, I think, you know, one way we could potentially manage that, that the, the number of requests that come in is by, um, you know, as we're doing engagement for our projects, identify, putting it out there, you know, there's an opportunity to install artwork in these in these projects and and maybe putting it back on the community if they um, want to sort of take the initiative um, and work through work with an artist directly um, to create a design. I, so, you know, that's this is kind of the messy part of the process that we haven't worked out. Um, I do think there will be a lot of interest in the neighborhoods in, um, you know, obviously in enhancing the sort of the sense of place with with these projects. So. Um, Sorry, I don't know if I have a great answer. <laughs> Maybe like an yeah. adopt a calming a traffic calming, like instead of adopt a park, we set up like an adopt a traffic circle, adopt a bulb out, and community organizations can adopt and care for them and, you know, touch them up when they get damaged. And then it's kind of back on the community and we could kind of facilitate that ad adopting process. I don't know. And I also, I hate to throw out an ugly word, but when we, uh, when public art oversees an art installation, there's insurance component. And if we have community out there wanting to paint their intersections, how does, do you, do you waive that? Or, I mean. Yeah, those are all things that would <laughs> need to be worked out, yeah. obviously with a contractor that's addressed, um, we wouldn't need to worry about that. They're already, um, insured and, and under contract with, with the city. Um, uh, you know, our typical or our current, um, uh, delivery method for, um, citizens is through the encroachment permit process. Um, that's the, you know, that's how the, both of the murals, the, the black lives matter and the, um, and the Kentucky street crosswalk were done. So, um, yeah, so we can, I mean, I think the, that's that's what we have to work with. Uh, we would probably use the encroachment permit process, but we could maybe find ways to streamline it. Um, you know, currently, there's really nothing up on the city's website that tells you how to go about uh, installing street art. So, um, you know, that's something that... that uh, I know David be, is, is great, <laughs> can, can help with that, um, streamlining that process. We can definitely support um, kind of looking at how encroachment permits are currently processed and trying to create some sort of um, 
uh, clear education and messaging on, on how to get through the process. Satisfied? All right. Well, it's on, to your um, point about the volume that might come in front of us, is it, um, I bet you have enough foresight to be able to sort of create an inventory maybe, yeah. of sorts yep. that you could communicate to David and uh, we could talk about that at an at a upcoming meeting and just at least get an understanding of scope and, and yeah. Yeah. imagine the possibilities of getting the community or other types of artists involved. Yeah, I think that's what, what David and I envisioned is um, we would provide him with a, a live map that shows uh, all existing locations and upcoming locations. And um, and then that can be used, uh, you know, maybe that's, that's publicly available and, and people can uh, nominate locations or if, uh, or if artists are interested in certain locations. Uh, yeah, so um, that, that can def we'll definitely do that. Great, thank you. Yeah. And um, beyond what you presented tonight, I, I'd ask that you keep in mind um, what you've seen this body do um, for for other projects that you might encounter um, mm -hmm. in your day to day work. So, thank you. Yeah, definitely. I just had one more comment too. Um, was thinking a little bit more about um, volunteer labor and um, you know, something that actually <laughs> Dennis made a, a quick aside about that made me a little uncomfortable, but um, I just want to be clear that when we work with artists, whether they're amateur or, prof or professional, that we should really champion paying a fair wage. And so when these designs come in, however, the, and I, I don't want to go too far down the rabbit hole about what this looks like and how do we put this out into the community, but we really champion paying people for their designs um, and their proposals. It's, it's really important. And then if we do end up using volunteer community members, kids, teens, you know, that's, it, it's strange how hard, <laughs> simple things like that are to do through the city. And so it would, the, probably the easiest method to do that would be to get in contract with somebody that can facilitate that and then subcontract or vol get volunteer work in exchange for experience and stipends or whatever that might be. Um, so I just, you know, that's where my brain is is currently going. And I, I just wanted to to bring that up in front of the committee before we, you know, talk too, too much about hard numbers and things like that. So. Thank you. Uh, honestly, I can't remember whether we had public comment on this item or not. Um, so I will open it to general public or to public comment. Not seeing any, I'll ask, were there any comments submitted ahead of the meeting? All right, we'll close general public comment and close this item. I thank Bjorn for showing up and sharing yeah. this with us. Appreciate thank it. Thank you so much. We'll be in touch. <laughs> That brings us to agenda item five. Uh, Chair, I think that we talked about resuming the schedule or the agenda as originally proposed. So it would, I think that would actually put item number two presentation by Ali uh, next, if that's, if I'm understanding that correctly. It probably makes more sense. That wasn't what was in my mind, but we'll go with that. <laughs> it's your meeting, so. <laughs> Yeah. Just FYI, you guys, I'm working with um, mixed numbers tonight, so I'm, I have a tiny bit of an excuse for being so off my game. Um, so agenda item number two. This um, this will be uh, this will be handled by outgoing committee member Ali Sponger. Okay, great. Thanks, everybody. Uh, I've got a presentation slide to go with this, um, but as I go into this session, I just want to um, say thank you to everybody on the committee, um, as this is my outgoing meeting, um, heading back to the work that I'm going to talk about briefly in my presentation tonight in a full-time in-person capacity in Niagara Falls, New York. Um, and But it has been such a pleasure in um, serving on this committee in the city of Petaluma. I've really enjoyed it, so thank you all for um, warmly welcoming, welcoming me into the projects uh, and into the community, so thank you. All right, I'm gonna get started here. I've got a lot of visuals in here, and I'm just gonna talk about 
three examples of some of the work that we've been doing in Niagara Falls. And just to open that up to, you know, kind of see what um, what we're doing out there, I'll try to talk a little bit about some of the challenges too, just to kind of see um, what that's looking like. Uh, so uh, we can go ahead to the next slide. Thanks, David. All right. Uh, so our public art happens through the Niagara Falls National Heritage Area. Uh, the National Heritage Area is one of 55 uh, in the United States uh, designated by Congress. Uh, our Niagara Falls National Heritage Area stretches from the falls themselves up, up to Youngstown on, in Lake Ontario. Uh, it's about 13 miles stretch, so fairly small when we think about National Heritage Areas. Many cover many states. Um, and, and what they're really important for is they build um, community uh, engagement to local histories. Um, and they're designated as national heritage areas because they are um, where important history happened. Uh, and it really extends beyond just national park uh, sites. Uh, and it is through the National Park Service as well. And so what we do in the Niagara Falls National Heritage Area, we have a, a big focus on a public art. We created our are really our core public art program in 2019 um, before the pandemic hit. So we kind of really took off uh, full full speed ahead and then had to kind of go a little bit slower as that happened. Um, so I'm going to talk about three projects, uh, again, briefly tonight. Uh, the NF Murals Project, which really is all encompassing of all of the public art murals uh, that we do. That ranges to working with the city of Niagara Falls, to working with business owners, um, uh, and with collaboratively, collaboratively with community as well. Um, then we'll also talk about the Prophet Isaiah's Second Coming House, which is an art environment, uh, which was a, a, a really interesting way that happened. Uh, the uh, Again, I'll get into that, but um, the artist, uh, Prophet Isaiah Robertson, had passed away in 2020, and he had worked with the Kohler Foundation out of Wisconsin uh, to preserve his home and artwork uh, for the community and for the future. And so the Kohler Foundation found the Niagara Falls National Heritage Area, reached out to us. Um, let me, I think I have the dates on there, 2020, 2021, and wanted to have us become the long-term stewards of this art environment. And so that was not in our um, management plan or anything like that, but it came across to us and we felt that was really critical to ensuring that important piece uh, stayed. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about um, more murals, but uh, kind of a response to uh, what was happening uh, in October of 2022 on Main Street, where most of Main Street is boarded up storefronts, uh, and that had been that way since the since the 90s. So some big challenges there. Um, next slide. Thank you. Um, so this is just a slide here, uh, just kind of showing just the um, the city of Niagara Falls graphic here. Um, you'll see where the arrow is pointed is where uh, we started our public mural making uh, NF murals program, um, which is in what's called the north end of the city of Niagara Falls. If you look down towards the bottom left of the map, you'll see a little island that's Goat Island, and then, then that's exactly where the falls are themselves. Um, and so that's about a little over a mile uh, away, but it is quite different. Uh, the downtown of Niagara Falls is really built around tourism. Uh, so you'd get a lot of tourism amenities, you know, hotels, chain restaurants, things like that. Um, most of the historic fabric of downtown Niagara Falls was lost to urban renewal in the 1960s. Um, and so it's kind of been built back up, um, but in a different way. Uh, so we've lost a lot of history in that area. Uh, where the arrow is in the north end here, and that is relevant to, of course, for the main street area with board up storefronts that I'll talk about, um, that whole area too actually does have some historic fabric left in those buildings. Um, there's also, a, of course, a lot of empty lots too. And so we are, a lot of our work is to engage our community in what they want to see for a future. Um, as for you know, decades, uh, they've, it's been neglected for any sort of progress, whether that be, you know, building new buildings, um, reusing the old ones for something new, or just any sort of community kind of investment there. So we're, we're really looking at public art as a way to engage our community. Um, okay, next slide. Um, all right, so here you'll see, and I don't know if it has to click again for the after section. Okay, perfect. Um, I'd like to show them side by side there. This is uh, our home base for NF murals here. This is uh, in an intersection called Main, uh, Main Street and Depot. It's at 
the other end of Maine. And so when I talk about that long stretch of storefronts, that's just to the south, which is to the right in the picture here. Um, but when we started uh, in 2019, it looked like the before picture that you see above. And I know I have before and after. Before is also on a very gloomy winter day. So it adds to the woo. Um, and then after, it's a nice sunny summer day. Um, but that's just how it ended up looking. Uh, so with that, um, the, those walls there and many other parts of the city are, there's a lot of opportunity, a lot of space to be able to bring community stories. Um, you know, being a much older city, minus some of the buildings that have been torn down, we have a lot of taller buildings. So murals felt really natural for us as a starting place. Um, and the city of Niagara Falls, I would say as well, had very limited public art prior to to these murals coming into play here. A couple murals in downtown over the years, um, I would say maybe maybe five, um, and I think maybe three to four sculptures. So very limited, and um, I think that's important to note because our community has not really been exposed so much to public art. So a lot of what we were doing was really guided by let's just try it and see what happens. Um, but we wanted to really ensure community engagement at the forefront. And so how we did these murals here was really try to create the most inclusive process that we could think of. Um, and again, not really modeling it off of anything, but just kind of just getting out there. And so the community here, um, you can't see in the picture, but to the right is the Niagara Falls Underground Railroad Heritage Center that the Niagara Falls National Heritage Area operates uh, and helped to build in 2018. So that's also very new. It's part of the new Niagara Falls Amtrak station that opened uh, in 2016, which is also connected to the restoration of an 1863 building too. A lot of things going on there. That's to the right in this picture. Um, and to the left is the Highland community in the North End, and it is a predominantly African-American community. Um, and so we knew when we were going in, we wanted to work directly with the community on that. Um, and I'm not sure what my next slide is. Maybe can we bounce to that? Yeah, this would be a good one. Okay, perfect. So how we did the process is we created a call for art and we had artists um, from Western New York apply that includes a city of, near, of Buffalo nearby as well. And uh, we had selected uh, a group of community leaders who were very active, who are very active in the Highland community to help us make the selection from those call for artists. And those folks don't necessarily or didn't necessarily come from any background in art. We operated as kind of the facilitators to help facilitate those discussions um, and, and kind of evaluation metrics and tools to help community leaders get to those places through an artistic lens. Um, but we ultimately wanted them to make the decision on what they, which artists through this call for art really felt like it fit for them. Um, and so we also structured the call for artists to um, not create a lot of barriers to entry, so to speak. So we didn't ask for, we didn't make an RFP process. We had it really be a qualifications process. Uh, five images of your portfolio. You can include a resume if desired and website links. So artists have the opportunity to share all of that. Um, but only thing required was the five images uh, from their portfolio. And then we had asked, I think it was either four or five questions, but pretty, pretty sure. And what we asked were, um, how do you describe your art process, art making process? Um, what's important to you about community uh, what is your knowledge and or connection of Niagara Falls and the Highland community specifically? And what, oh, and then our last question, which was an important theme of this project was, as it related to the Heritage Center, the Underground Railroad Heritage Center is, what does freedom mean to you? Um, because we knew we wanted to build that connection into history, the stories of the Underground Railroad, past to present. Um, and so by doing that, we re read these responses and the community leaders got to almost kind of get inside, you know, the minds and hearts of the artist applicants. Um, and so for our first uh, first season in 2019, uh, they had selected eight artists. Madonna, who is here in this picture, is one of them who painted Harriet Tubman that you can kind of see there in the background um, and became one of our signature pieces here. Uh, she's an artist uh, from just up the street. And she had painted a, a smaller mural before, um, but one of the really wonderful things that we learned through this process um, and from her and a few others is creating opportunity where there really hadn't been any opportunity before on a localized level. And so we really looked to, and, and a lot of this call for artists process was 
boots on the ground. Our team went to high school art teachers, asked to make connections to former students. Um, one former student actually didn't have access to any sort of computer or Wi-Fi. Um, and so he, I worked with him to have him send me Instagram messages um, of all of his application materials because he couldn't actually access any of the things that we were, we put into the process. So even in that moment, we had to get kind of figure out, well, how do we make this accessible when we have discovered, and we kind of knew, but having experienced it firsthand, a process to be accessible to the community when access to technology was quite limited. So that was an important piece to learning about this process. Um, but we did a lot of talking to people on, on, on the streets as this is a bit busy intersection here um, and making connections from there and then visiting people's houses uh, to follow up with them. And, you know, their sister does art and this and that. And so it was a really interesting way that we discovered we needed to do the process and we've continued it that way since. Um, and, and even so the, the further we go into this, into the years, the more we need to keep doing that. We almost have to work even harder to do it um, because we kind of almost touched kind of like the entry points through our community leaders that we are familiar with. And we need to get familiar with other people who are maybe doing artwork in their home and have never came across our, us before or who have never been um, presented with a chance to be able to do a public art mural. So important piece. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. Um, okay, so here's another picture here. We've got a, a couple of the murals in this long stretch. The way we kind of did it is we divided these concrete sections by kind of these like natural concrete lines um, and that those kind of broke up the mural spaces. They're kind of all different sizes, mostly horizontal. Um, and how we did that with each cohort each year, um, we kind of assigned the artist locations based on their artwork and style and the story content so that it felt like, it, it, it visually kind of in flow made sense along the street. It's hard to see in the picture and there's an uncompleted mural um, just kind of on the far back right. That mural ended up actually becoming a Black Lives Matter mural um, after um, a protest in Niagara Falls during the summer of June 2020. Somebody had spray painted Black Lives Matter on that empty space as it was waiting for a mural. Um, we just hadn't assigned and, and got one in there yet. And uh, our, our team kind of stood out there and we're like, well, you know, we support this message. We want to uplift this message, but we don't want to leave spray paint just on the wall. Um, and so what we did uh, in the matter in, in six days is we reached out to a couple artists and we had them design a collaborative Black Lives Matter mural in that space. I don't think I have a picture of that in this um, slide. Uh, deck here, but uh, it came together in su such a short period of time. And I think that was our most interactive mural uh, to date with people coming by and participating on the spot. Um, and so we saw that in real time, that that was a really, really important piece of these of these murals and, and for our community to be able to have that opportunity for that to be in their, in their space that they walk, bike and drive by every day. Um, and then my caption here, creating opportunities for dialogue. Uh, this is a great group conversation that was going on when this picture was taken. Um, but we do a lot of tours in this corridor here um, for public art and our theme being around freedom um, and listening directly to what our community, the Highland community was looking for, you know, beyond the Underground Railroad of what those connections were. And it, what we learned is that folks really wanted their stories to be highlighted and the, these are stories that beyond the community, a lot of times folks were unaware of. And so there wasn't a lot of, I want to see this specifically mixed with these colors with this particular picture. What we saw was, or what we learned was a lot of, well, I want John Spider Martin's story, who's the gentleman who's pictured, depicted in this mural here, who was a famous jazz artist who grew up around the street and used to play around the corner, I'm sorry and used to play at a, a very well-known place, the Ontario House, which was located at the end of this block uh, here in this picture, which is no longer standing as, as many buildings uh, are in Niagara Falls. And so we heard that people just wanted to see their stories highlighted in a large visible public way. And so we listened directly to that and those are the stories that we put forward. Uh, next one, please. 
Okay, I'm going to change it up real quick because I want to keep us moving here. Uh, Prophet Isaiah second coming house. So this is the art environment uh, that I was talking about. Um, it does not look as epic in this picture. Again, we've got kind of a more winter scene going on. Um, but the full um, creation of this includes uh, a 22 foot cross and all this other artwork that was created on the right side of this where there's a little bit of fencing because this was in, in process. And so um, when the Kohler Foundation uh, purchased this home from Prophet Isaiah's uh, widow uh, to preserve it, um, they also uh, hired a conservation and preservation firm in Pennsylvania to restore the artworks on the exterior, on the outside. What ended up happening is that they were, um, most of the pieces were beyond repair, being out in the elements for so long. And when Prophet Isaiah was alive, he was constantly repainting, maintaining, fixing to a level that I don't think could be replicated unless we were the artist himself. And so what the, the firm had recommended to Kohler Foundation and to us, and we were involved in the process that whole way, um, was to um, build recreated pieces. And so we kind of found a, a balance between a few original pieces coming back and then these recreated pieces so that it can withstand the elements for you know many, many decades to come. And the original pieces that we weren't bringing back would go to the Kohler, Foundation, Kohler Foundation's John Michael Kohler Art Center in Wisconsin that opened last year. Um, and that would be displayed with other artists, folk artists like Prophet Isaiah. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, here we go. I did have pictures. Okay, so here is, sorry, I talked about all that before showing pictures. Here is the... Um, Ver versions of the 20 foot, 22 foot cross and what it looks like or what it looked like um, at one point uh, from the exterior. It's a mm -hmm. residential home right in a neighborhood. Um, so many people in the community grew up with this, you know, with this house, with Prophet Isaiah outside every day working on it. Um, and he also did the inside too that you can see in that one picture there as well. And so we have been embarking on a new journey of you know, restoring, managing, and operating a um, art environment. And what does that look like? And so the one of the most important things, just like all of our public art projects that we've been working on, is that we wanted to make this um, for the community first and foremost. So there's a lot of um, art museums who are very interested in, you know, in this project in some way. Um, and it could very easily become kind of closed off um, to the community. And we decided through our planning of the management to make it community centric first. And we wanted to, we still, what we're working on now is identifying what do what does the community need a space like this for? And it's small on the inside of the house, but there's a big backyard space. And so while we're preserving the artwork, and, and maintaining it for years to come. We also want to be able to create it as a place, again, for the neighborhood, uh, the, the local community to use it and have it take ownership over it as their space first and foremost. Okay, next slide, please. Um, a couple in progress pictures. Um, I'm in there uh, with my team members, Sarah and Saladin. Oh. Saladin has been uh, our main on site uh, manager throughout the whole construction process. In the uh, picture on the right, you can kind of see it's a little, there's, it's a little in rough shape. And that was before we started the whole outdoor renovation and construction. Um, we've put up uh, all new fencing, repaired the garage in the back, um, fixed siding, windows. Um, and we're now moving on the interior renovations, again, to make it a space uh, usable by the public and for, for limited tours as well. Um, and so uh, it was in need of a full, you know, a full renovation in a lot of ways, minus the artwork, which is, you know, again, preserved. And on the inside, it's pretty, pretty great. Uh, not doesn't need a lot of work, mostly just the outside. Um, so that's a picture there of just kind of what that looked like and the journey that we're embarking on on that. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, moving next project, keeping us moving along here as well. Um, and so this project here, our, we're kind of calling it our History Lives Here project, our Main Street number two project. Lots of things happen on Main Street. Um, this building here um, is called 2018 Main Street. That's its address. And uh, this building was in danger of demolition uh, starting in October. And there are um, lots of challenges between the city and the property owner. And again, these buildings have all, all in a long row, um, have sat vacant since 
the 90s. Uh, I think this one was one of the last ones to close. It was a furniture store in like about, I think it was like 1995. And it was one of the last ones to stay open. And so there's a few residential apartments, uh, a couple things that have continued on on this uh, long strip on Main Street, but not not many. So what we really, responding to the the threat of demolition, which is not completely off the table just yet either. Um, we really wanted to bring awareness to not losing any more historical fabric without, you know, without coming to a solution, without talking to the community first and foremost. Um, many of the community members and, and, and folks who live nearby, I have been really frustrated um, because for decades, this has been their main street where they haven't had access to grocery stores, to businesses and, and uh, those necessities in life. They have to go beyond their own neighborhood. And many folks don't have the easy, accessible transportation to be able to do that. And and so we really look at this like, you know, what can public art do? What can community engagement do to be able to open up the conversation and the dialogue around these really, really big challenges that take a lot of funding, a lot of cooperation, and a lot of momentum to be able to move forward. So we started with this concept here. Um, and again, created. You know, sometimes we work really fast and we created this in three days um, after hearing first the threat of the demolition with uh, permission from the property owner here. Um, very long, complex process. But um, we created History Lives Here to signify that past to present piece of, you know, history is is still alive. It's still within these walls. It's still within these streets, within the people here. And we wanted to bring awareness and attention to that. And so this was, again, another project where people passing by picked up a paintbrush, jumped right in, and it really created, a, again, an uplifting experience, but also one where people could almost speak for the first time about to somebody, you know, about what's going on. And again, while we're a nonprofit and we have limitations on what we can do is we don't own this building, uh, nor are we the city. Um, you know, I think being able to open up those dialogues to create that ownership and empowerment to start to move, move the needle a little bit on some of that. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. So, yep. Here's a picture of, um, uh, some folks painting, um, on that, on the history lives here mural. And the photo on the left is actually a little bit further down. I, I didn't include the same building here, but this one here, so the, the two buildings in the picture on the left are no longer standing. Uh, the building on, in the right middle is, and it's the Connection Building, which is a teen center, incredible uh, program. Um, and then the Jens Building Department Store, which was very well known. Anytime we talk to anybody in the community, they're like, oh, I remember Jens riding that golden elevator up and to the, to the third floor and this and that. And so it's we're also in a process of capturing stories. So we have an oral history project that's a part of this because we know that that is also key to uh, bringing, bringing this objective and goals here forward. Well, what's next for that Jens building um, is we have, there is a mural on the front that says, imagine the possibilities. What's next for that is we're actually going to be installing um, in all of the many windows, which I don't remember the number off the top of my head, but lots of windows, um, banners on the inside that show that there are um, prints of some, a local artist painting of portrait the portrait ladies they're called and she had painted from the 1930s to the 1990s and her work goes mostly unknown uh her name her name was polly king uh and her son who's 92 has been keeping her legacy alive and pushing and pushing for gallery representation and to get her artwork out there as much as possible uh, i don't think i included any of her artwork here i'm just seeing things and kind of giving a little bit more info um but we're bringing awareness we're looking to bring awareness to the building and the stories at the same time. And so by also then using the windows as well as a way to display her artwork and bring awareness to that. And we're going to pair that with um, an exhibition of those original pieces in a building up the street from here. Again, looking at activating Main Street, creating opportunities for, for folks to get involved. Next slide. And I think we're almost done. I think that was the video. Oh, okay, perfect. Um, you can go to the next one, David. That's fine. Okay. And this is another, this is another one of the, um, plywood storefront murals that we did here. Um, we are the community. Oh, and then the other one is up in the picture on the left up there. And there's, those are some kids that came by, uh, and started to paint managing kids painting on the spot takes a little bit of work. Uh, we're, we're working on 
formalizing that process a little bit more <laughs> after that. Um, it was a great experience for the kids, but uh, it definitely becomes a blank canvas. So um, on another wall, not this one on the other side, we got all sorts of things uh, beyond the template, which was a fun experience, but very different. So uh, next slide, which is my last slide, um, talking you know as much as I can, lots of content and information, um, but just wanted to give you all like a little bit of an overview of some of the things that we're working on there. And going forward, if I can ever be a resource um, to bounce ideas off for Petaluma, anything like that, I would absolutely love to um, and stay in contact. And if you have any questions about any of these projects now or later, let me know. Thank you. Fabulous. Thank you. Yeah, so um, <laughs> spoke with Allie when she got on the committee and heard about some of this and looked into some of it. And this is just so much more. I mean, now a little bit of time has passed, but the, the, the volume of work and the breadth of things you have here that you're plugged into is really inspiring. So I wish you were here longer and more of it would rub off on us. We'd be able to learn from it. Um, but uh, which um, we do have uh, an opportunity for the public to comment. Um, there's no one here. If uh, did you receive anything ahead of time? Okay. No, I did not receive right. anything. So we'll close in public comment. And uh, I guess I'd encourage everyone to stay in touch with Allie um, to take her up on her offer. But in, in the meantime, um, for, while we're here, if there's anything sort of concise you guys want to ask her or. Um, add to this please do it just all looks amazing and the work here you guys are doing just way to go maybe we can all go on a field trip <laughs> in the summer, in the summer <laughs> i i just wanted to thank you for i i put a little bit of pressure on ali to present tonight but um you know i I, I too, when Ali joined our, our committee, looked into the resources of what you do for work, and it was, it was overwhelming. And so I really, um, I, I talked with Melissa about trying to do this more regularly as a committee and sharing our, all of us have very unique experiences with the arts and with cultural um, inclusivity. And so I think that um, Ali is no exception. And I really wanted, while we still had her, to, to pick her brain a little bit and hear a, a high summary of what she does. And thank you so much for that, because it is so inspiring to see what, you know, some of these things are definitely aspirations that we can pull and use in our program and adapt to make uh, it right for our community. And I think that's, um, that's something that really uh, inspires me to keep doing the work that this body does and our program does. So. Thank you for all that information, and I will definitely be in touch to to pick your brain continuously. Oh, can we make the formal ask for us to uh, receive that the presentation okay. circulated? Sure. Thank you. All right. Well, with that, we'll um, close that agenda item and move on to the approval of minutes um, from three previous meetings. Are there any changes? from a committee member to any of the minutes. Seeing no changes, we'll approve those minutes. And move on to agenda item five. Five, <laughs> thank you. And this is gonna be uh, um, reported on by uh, our public art specialist, David Ward. Thank you. Um, so yeah, tonight, this is the Kenilworth Playground Public Art Project um, Committee review the draft of request for qualifications document that was uh, included in tonight's packet and uh, discuss project goals and selection criteria with recommendation to, to publish draft RFQ document. So this item I've brought before you tonight is a 90% draft RFQ document for the project. Um, Melissa already pointed out a, a small typo <laughs> on one of the pages. So again, this is a draft document. This is the committee's chance to, you know, uh, take a look at things, make comments. Um, but I really want to stress that tonight's goal for this item is twofold. So the first is that we ask the committee to generate clear, concise project goals that support the vision and mission of the public art program in this project and also underscore the role that this contracted artist will fill and how they represent the interests of this body and the overall ideal qualified candidate of this project. So 
these goals that we we talk about tonight will be used in the RFQ uh, for applicants to respond to, and in turn, the committee will score their applications using these same goals and selection criteria. And then the second part of this item is, uh, the second goal, I should say, is the, the committee to provide final feedback um, about this document as a whole, including recommendations for maybe additional networks where staff can share this opportunity to draw a larger number of applications. Melissa provided some comments um, as well, and um, I will uh, incorporate those into the document. So um, so those are the two, the two pieces of this, but if both goals are achieved tonight, staff recommends publishing this opportunity on May, Monday, May 1st, which is next Monday, um, to keep in line with the park project's timeline. And before we get into the discussion, I wanted to make a few notes about what those next steps look like. So if published on May 1st, the opportunity will be open for six weeks of applications closing on June 9th. The committee will then have uh, about a week and a half to rank eligible applications um, after staff filters through them. And we will use slide room to do that, um, to virtually and anonymously do that. Uh, as a body. And then at the June Public Art Committee meeting on the 22nd, uh, staff will present these results and recommend the committee select an artist to offer this awarded contract to. And um, we plan to get in contract with an artist in the next few weeks following that so that the artist can jump right in and join the park designer team. A, uh, a timeline reminder about that, the park project, um, is that they're currently um, in the final selection of of um, getting into contract with with a designer, and um, the first benchmark for the preliminary design is uh, is a thirty percent completion of the design, and that's anticipated for August of this summer. So we should be looking for that for our artist representative or or team. I, I'm using the word artist kind of to as a catch all to get into contract and have some time to pull up a chair and start working with the design team about ideas and um, and how they see public art and play spaces, um, you know, all those concepts, um, you know, right away. So, so if those two objectives in tonight's item are clear, I'll turn it back over to our vice chair. Thank you. Thank you, David. I was um, going to recommend that we handle this the same way we handled the discussion about Mary Fuller McChesney, where we would ask clarifying questions to staff, open it to public comment, and come back. But I think I'd like to change that to open it to public comment now, and then have a general discussion that includes questions. Um, so I see no one present. Do we receive any uh, notices ahead of time for public comment on this item? I have not um, seen any public comments for this item. Okay, we'll close public comment and open discussion. Um, would any uh, committee member like to lead off? Okay, so my, um, my take on this, I've read this through a number of times and I'm really surprised at how difficult it is for me to sort of, to really get this, to get my head around this. Because I think this is, I've always had the impression, I've always had this archetypal piece in my mind um, that sort of, I think, first spawned this idea with Chair Abercrombie, and that was um, Oleg Lavikin's sort of uh, La Brea um, skeletal piece, which was, to my mind, very, was very much a, a product of an artist. Okay? And, we, I've really expanded my understanding of what's being asked here and totally agree with the idea of making it an environment, a space, um, some sort of creative um, structure or structures that's, that, that meet the goals that, that are stated so clearly here. Um, but the conclusion I've come to is that the requirements that are being asked of these applicants pretty much take it out of the realm of artist and put it in the designer realm or the architect realm or the some sort of professionally connected on the ability to execute public projects realm. And that to me is, is it's not disappointing. I think it's reality, but I, if, I'd love to hear what other people think because that's the, 
it, um, I, because of that, if, if you all agree with that, then I think the emphasis on the language here really has to be on stressing the level of creativity and artistry that the applicant should bring to this. I think it goes without saying if an artist is involved, that's going to happen. But there's um, so much about this. We're talking about designers, call them artists, sort of under the, you know, under the collective uh, single word sort of category categorization, um, creative teams, landscape architects, architects. Um, but that's um, so that's the first part of it for me. And the second part of it is now that I'm um, there's I guess I'd like staff to, to explain to us what it is that we will be it's listed what we will be seeing. But how do you, um, when the request for qualification is answered, the applicants will supply something very much, you know, that it's going to be, these are going to be high level designers, I think, that will be applying. And to what extent do you think we should, um, actually, I'll stop there because I don't think it's probably appropriate to answer that quite for me to pursue that question now. But if you guys, if you guys, you know, read this through and you have any sort of concurrence or dissent on my take on it, I appreciate hearing that. Um, and then everything else, let's talk about it. Do you mind if I respond first? Um, so you're um, not the first person to bring up, you know, that same, um, the, the role question, right? Is this for an artist or is this for a designer? And I think that um, that's a great question because you know, in a way, I don't think that this is an opportunity for anybody to walk into. I think that we are looking for a specific type of person that, you know, if, as you've read in the RFQ that we, you know, there's some professional standards that we asked them. We wanted them to be familiar with site plan and architectural review. We wanted them to be familiar with, you know, uh, you know, have accessible uh, engineering and, and things like that, because, um, in a way, we're going to rely a lot on the park designer and um, ultimately it'll go out for bid to um, to build what is designed here. But I think that it is um, for the caliber of what we're asking of and, you know, making it play safe, making it appropriate and, and maintenance wise, making this, you know, durable. I, um, I feel pretty confident in what we some of these requirements and eligibility factors that we've listed in this document. And I think that there can be, we can underscore some language here that, you know, really speaks to the artistry that we're looking for here. And we do really want people, I, in my interpretation of this conversation we've had over the last year plus, is that we really want someone to come to the table and dream big and be able to take those that big vision and then turn it into a reality and not make too many compromises about what the initial idea was. And then after you plug it into all the, ADA requirements, safety requirements, play safe materials, it doesn't get turned into this compromise, right? And so um, I think there are there is a, a creative way that we can make this document more appealing to artists, but I do think that, you know, um, to get something to the level of what we've discussed, it's, it, you know, I'm, I'm happy to look at the selection criteria a little bit more, but... Um, you know, I, I, I'm feeling pretty confident in some of the base level requirements looking left and right at other projects. It's hard to find other public art projects that really have, have done what we're doing here. And I've, I've looked to the committee, uh, to, to pitch some of those things. And I followed up on a lot of them, including, uh, a long interview with the tunnel tops folks. Um, but it, it's been, it's, it's, uh, we're walking on a tight rope here of like what we're, what we're asking for our, from our applicants. So, um, I think I'll stop rambling there. Thanks. It's really helpful. I mean, there's concurrence. I think this is, uh, I, I think the product of this will, will yield the right person. It's just, I think it, it's adjustment for me to understand really that it's, that the artists in the room probably will not be able to meet the bar that's being set here. And I would like to add though, that, Obviously, we need someone to be able to cover all these ground level, you know, requirements and understandings of how things work so that they can have intelligent conversations with the site designers and the city planners. 
I would also say that there are probably a lot of designers who have been constrained, who are looking for this opportunity to bring artistry in. And I would also add that any artist who's interested in this job is going to outsource the calculations. They're going to bring that talent in so that their vision can be accomplished, I would think. I don't think it's a one-off kind of person. Maybe the, there's a visionary and there's the ancillary, you know, boots on the ground adjunct. So it'll be interesting to see who responds to this. I would just say, and I agree, I think that those folks who are reviewing this and it's coming across across their desk, across their um, uh, online presence of being able to kind of see that, I think that that collaborative approach, like an artist team or an artist that can, you know, be able to, you know, understand like, okay, those are, I don't have that skill set, but I've done this work here so I can bring that in and, and bring that all together. So I, I think it, it will be, we'll need to be able to see that when the applications come through. Um, and once that comes through, it's, it's a little bit easier maybe to identify those particular pieces and we'll definitely wanna make sure we're on the lookout for that. Um, but you know, I think I, I could see it really happening again where that, that visionary is able to put those pieces together, uh, especially if they have that experience. I have a question for the committee. Um, would we like to see in the final published document uh, a reorganization of some of these qualities that we're looking for in terms of eligibility, I, I guess is what I'm driving at, to set it up more as these are must-have qualities and these are preferred qualities? You know, some, some of these are, we're asking quite a bit of experience for some of these things. And if, you know, we are relying on the ability to use subcontractors and the, des the park design team, is uh, going to be very qualified, multiple team members, you know, with lots of different landscape, hardscape, foundational, environmental um, experience. So we can set the document up a little bit more to pull qualities into a preferred category or, you know, or soften the language, I guess, to say, have experience or adjacent experience with XYZ qualities that are less technical and less, you know, hardlined, um, just the thought, but, um, as we're thinking about publishing on Monday, um, these are things that I, I might want some direction on so um, I could be clear of who we're trying to catch in, in this opportunity. I don't think you need to soft pedal the requirements. I think you've done a great job of saying, of laying it out there, what needs to happen. So I, let's be clear about that. I think all, honestly, we're gonna be judging portfolios Really? And we're going to, and the way they described their portfolios, what their role was in it, and being able to judge whether or not they can handle it, whether we love the work, and whether we can imagine something um, from them in this community. Would it be useful to include just visual goals? Like, we love the La Brea Tar Pits, you know, as, as maybe sort of, you know, showing somebody this is how wide open we are. We don't want this, but, you know, it's really open for interpretation and we're not limited to prefab play structures. Or is that? Uh, yeah, go. I'm saying please no prefab play structures. Right. I think they're surrounding our city and starting to gobble us up. But um, yeah, just- Maybe a lookbook or sort of a tone cool. that we want to set in a visual sense would really, someone would say, oh wow, this is, you know, I can really flex my creativity or, you know, know they're, they're too far out there for me. I don't know. Based on what this committee submitted to you um, months ago, um, do you think you could pull something like that together that, that would either, would be representative, or do you think that would be um, uh, too uh, I think it's a good idea. Uh, yeah, I really like that suggestion. And I would probably include less than, you know, 10, probably closer to like three or five examples, but I would. I would pull from the lower, the lower or smaller scale, not lower scale, the smaller scale ones that we looked at, not the two million plus dollar, you know, proposals. So, but we we looked at plenty. I think between everybody on this committee, I have probably you know close to a, over a dozen to you know pull from in the the suggestions category. So, I'm happy to include three or four or five in the actual <laughs> document so people have an idea. Um, but to also to the to Hannah's comment too, I wanted to to underscore that 
um, we're using the word site specific and unique. So prefab is, is a quick, uh, not that's yeah. not eligible for us. And, um, I know that site specific isn't a, an incredible term to use because I think that there's a little bit of like a conceptual aspect of that, that you're trying to talk about the tie to the, to the history of the, the land and the history of the community. And there's a little bit more of a conceptual narrative to that. But I think the way that I've been describing and using site specific is to say something that uniquely fits and speaks appropriate scale, theme, aesthetic to the overall design. So it wouldn't be found at um, Wiseman Park. It wouldn't be appropriate for McNear Park. It would be for Kenilworth Park because it, as Kenilworth is a unique site, so. All right, well then I would say, if you think you can do that without um, suggesting that this is a sort of prescriptive menu to, to pull design cues from then, or maybe even put that in there. Um, some language that helps uh, say this is sort of, these are the things that have turned on a few members of the committee that are ask, sending this RFQ out and do that. Um, I put together some, I, I tried to put together sort of summary sentences to, to imagine if, you, if the designer or the artist had to take away one thing and go think about it or get their head in the space, what would it be? And I put together some language and I, I have like 20 of these and none of them really feel right. But um, the two best ones I came up with were a unique inspired artistic environment that stimulates creative and active open-ended play. And it's missing stuff, right? But it, and it's also got too much stuff in there. But um, the another one is a landmark play space, visually striking, stimulating, original, engaging, and memorable. Okay? So th some of the things that I like about those are it, it's calling for this exuberant creativity or this, this total uniqueness of vision. And those are the things that I think if we had in there that we'd be, if you know, um, people would be digging deep to say, like, am I capable of something like this, of, of running as far away from the, from the prefabricated stuff as possible? Um, and beyond that, David, the way you laid out our goals for the evening, it's like I can't get my head around some of that. I mean, it's very, it's very I think it's very difficult to add really meaningful um, goals to this that aren't already in here for me. So I'd, I'd like to hear from the rest of the committee um, if there are things that, that they'd like to add to what's already in here. Uh, one of the things I was looking for was a little uh, clarification on the budget, if we could. Um, I mean, I agree with your earlier comments when I was reading through all of this, and it was like, are we looking for an artist? Are we looking for an architect? Are we looking for a landscaper? I mean, you know, how do we pull it all together? And then I realized we're not pulling it together. The team that comes in and proposes, they're the ones pulling it together. Um, but I, uh, I, then I wanted to kind of go over the budget. If you could just refresh our memory on that. I mean, when I add up the three numbers that are included, it's the 30,000 for the um, initial creative services, and then 150000 for the installation, fabrication, construction, and then a last 30000 of the optional, you know, emergency, whatever, what did you call that? Um, contingency. Contingency, thank you. Um, but obviously there's other funds going into this structure. Right. Um, so this was an item at RMPC last week, and we talked a lot about there um, to cut to the chase. There isn't a they didn't tell the, any of the interviewing designers, um, design teams, I'll call them that this is the budget make something in this budget. They want a number to be, you know, they know they have a rough understanding of what is available in funding, but letting the design team dream as big as they want. And then once they deliver a 30 percent design and it's you know, $80 million, it's not going to be $80 million, but then they can reel it in and say, okay, well, we were thinking so something to this scale and that will bring the cost down and this will be the footprint. And these are the other required elements that we, we didn't see in the design. And 
these are auxiliary kind of elements. So then they can work within the, the project scope. And, and Hannah, feel free to jump in too if you want to comment on the discussion last week. But to clarify the numbers in this document, yes, so $30,000 as contingency, $30,000 for this design award for right. this artist to represent this body and program as the as a playground designer, as a, as a public art designer, um, and be a part of that team. And then, you know, roughly $150,000 towards the installation of fabrication. And yes, the uh, Parks and Recreation has secured Measure M funds and Prop 68 funds that will go into the entire park design. And again, there's, there's certain spending um, uh, timelines and, and restrictions on when those funds need to be committed. Um, and they align very well with the outlined uh, timeline by project manager Erica Jacobs, who's in our public works department. Um, so she's done a fantastic job, you know, laying that out. Um, but again, I, I think we should adopt a similar thing, right, is to have the idea of, you know, we're not designing tunnel tops here. That was a 20 year long project with multi-million dollar funding. So we are, you know, if we plant the seed of $150,000 and then some additional things get added on there, or maybe it's a smaller footprint than we imagined and estimates come in shyer than we thought they were going to, then great. But at least we have a benchmark to kind of work and slide that scale around with a little bit. Um, and so I hope that clarifies yes. what we're committed to. And I, and I think that the, when we go put this out to bid through the park project, this will be a, a uh, somewhat of like an interdepartmental grant uh, if we can jump on that design team, um, their contracted bid. So that's how things would kind of work out. And just to clarify, this $210,000 is already in your uh, encumbered funds. For the last Q, Q2 update? Yeah. Well, no. So the $30,000 was, but uh, we okay. haven't this body hasn't committed. Yes, we're going to do 120. Yes, we're doing 150. But I think from the last year's conversations, that's the wheelhouse that sounds like everybody was pretty comfortable with. And when we talked about some of the, the scale and the designs that we all looked at as inspirational pieces, you know, we were talking between 100 and 200, very, very roughly. Right. Um, so, you know, taking kind of the average and, and running with that. Okay, so then another 180,000, we would be recommending to encumber out of the funds that's still available yeah ultimately when the right. final design you know happens there will be a lump sum of what the installation and fabrication cost will come in but right now what we're talking about is we'll we'll recommend a thirty thousand dollar design contract for yeah. this this artist to be a part of reporting to us regularly being part of all the creative services like uh, the team meetings, the the mock-ups, like everything that will go into their time to participate in the project, but also delivering us a proposal too. So that'll, right. they'll be a part of, you know, this project for the next two fiscal years. And that's what that $30,000 will pay for. Okay. So just to wrap my head around it though, we would have to encumber the additional funds, right? To, to build what's proposed yes it's yeah so the i think that this this body is i mean as if i'm understanding things correctly is that there will be whatever is designed for the space there will be additional contributions from the public art fund to help build that and it will be significantly reduced because they will be doing grading for the site there will be a you know there will be hardscape features that this fund won't we won't have to pay for from right. the public art fund right. so there will be huge reductions in, you know, excavation costs and for foundational purposes for whatever structures are built. Um, so it'll it'll be come at a at a discounted price, so okay. to say. Yeah, and okay. from Parks and Rec, it, everything still seems like very loose. Um, like there's you know, community outreach, but there's no real like design elements yet. Um, but there is a deadline coming up to secure funds, I believe this summer, am I correct? Uh, I'm not or sure fall. about which ones, but yeah, so the first 30% design is August. Yeah. Um, so, but I don't know if they need to have funds committed by then yet. So that's something I don't wanna I comment. think to like lock in that, that grant money 
um, which is we've seen through the city, we're losing out on a lot of of a lot of funds because we haven't come forward and had those plans. Um, so a lot of stuff hasn't been being built or followed through on. Um, so yeah, it it should be interesting, I think. But from the update at Parks and Rec, it was still seemed like they were just wanting feedback and what design elements, what kind of stuff would you still like to see at Kenilworth? So yeah, I, I don't know. I get nervous and then they bring us a playground. This happens all the time where they're like, we're going to redo a park. And you're like, cool. And then they just like, you know, bring you what they put at Grand and it has nothing that the community wanted and there's still no shade and there's no picnic benches and there's, so that's where I'm nervous from Parks and Rec standpoint, but um, I'm hoping this will be a, a different project because there are more funds and money's available and they are asking people to think big, but I feel like their budget isn't that big either, right? It's like 250. Uh, I don't. I don't really want to like num name numbers, but I I think it's much larger than that. Okay. Um, between the two grant sources, between and I grants. think there are, there are others as well that I'm not privy to. But um, yeah, I I think that our contribution will be smaller um, in terms of the entire project site. Um, our our contribution will be much smaller than what's coming from Parks and Rec and Public Works. Okay. So I think in terms of goals, um, the committee goals and the community goals, you've reflected, you've captured what the, came back in the um, survey that went out. And I don't know that we can do a whole lot more than that, but I would inject as much of the sort of language that would um, direct, you know, to, to get this exuberant creativity going as, as you can. I'm not sure where to do that, but I would take if you're going to start injecting stuff, that's the sort of language I'd put in there. Yeah, I, I think the only last thing is um, that I want to add is that, you know, I, I just want to provide a clear path forward to the, the, the person that would, you know, or the people, the team, the individual that, um, can best uphold and meet what we're trying to envision, right? And so um, how do you, how would this body like to rank that person or that team to do it? And if you're saying the committee, because there are <laughs> several sections of goals from the community survey, from the citywide goals and priorities and the community, the, excuse me, the committee's preliminary discussion that I put together and I, I distilled those things down. Um, if those are the, what we what this body likes would like to rank the incoming applications using, then uh, great. I can I can definitely take those goals that are already in that document and turn them into things that we can assign scores to. Um, I you know I I guess the ask to make project goals was an opportunity to describe your ideal candidate and really talk about the qualities that you would love to see, whether they be just, um, you know, use, use the words exuberant creativity and landscape or landmark space for play and creativity. Like those are great. I, I think those are great things that you can judge uh, a letter of intent and say, this was a seven out of 10, or this was a, this was a, a 12 out of 20 or something. You I think you could do a lot with that. So I was, I was giving this body an opportunity to to write that, you know, write that rubric, I guess. Um, but, it, you know, I just need direction. If we want to use what's already in the document, that's totally appropriate. I don't think I can add anything, um, and it doesn't sound like the rest of the committee um, is in position to add. So, um, particularly given the the sh short timeline, you're going to draft this straight away and, and publish it. So, um, mm -hmm. I would say um, move ahead with it. 
Okay. All right. And thank you for the work you've put into this. It's super comprehensive. Well, and I, I admit that this is a little out of my wheelhouse. We've, we've never built a playground before, so it is a little unique, but, um, you know, a lot of research and a lot of talking and, and following up on, on the leads that this committee has provided has been really enlightening. So I appreciate everybody's work on this too. I'm, I'm just the aggregator, I'm just the aggregator of <laughs> pooling everything that we've talked about over the last year. So, um, so thank you. So does this mean formal action? Um, I actually, uh, let me make sure that I'm, I'm not, um, stepping on my own toes here, but, um, no, since we're not selecting and we're not um, doing any expenditures or anything, it doesn't need any action, if uh, formal action. But if if the committee is in, you know, uh, is content with everything and and agrees that the document is ready to go, then we'll publish on May on Monday, May first. Okay, thank you. I'm confident now that that what we get from these applicants um, based on the, the application criteria, we'll be able to sort of piece together in a meaningful way. So thank you for your work. Okay. Thank you. All right, let's um, then that will close out that agenda item. And move on to agenda item six. That's subcommittee reports and committee comment. Is that correct? Um, sure. So, I know the um, the fine balance committee subcommittee hasn't met recently. I, I'm happy to to talk about that project a little bit more it, unless Christopher you had any um, notes about the um, fine about fine balance um, no but I have a few notes but I think you can deliver it probably more concisely than I can sure um, I think the quick snapshot of where we're at right now is that uh, we had a meeting uh, where I met with uh, Jerome who is our chief building official and we met with um, Chris Lynch and uh, our, our vice chair, Chris, uh, Christopher Smith, was there. And we just talked about some of the outstanding uh, things that are required uh, that was in the feedback in the uh, the <laughs> building permit application. That was tough. Um, and they were mainly on two larger features, which one was addressing ADA concerns about access to the park. Um, and then the other element was uh, lighting. And so... Um, from a few discussions, I won't get into the weeds in it, but it sounds like we have a pretty clear understanding of how to meet those requirements um, very easily without changing or compromising any of the elements in the project. And so uh, artist Brian Goggin is on track to resubmitting the project. And then um, I don't think actually Christopher knows this, but I, I have a meeting next week with the public works team as well to talk about um, some of the elements that Brian um, requires uh, to clean up the site, to get the site prepped. Um, so it'll be some city uh, support there and they're, they're fairly minor things. So we're not, you know, now that we've sorted out the electrical and we don't need to dig a trench and route conduit down there anymore, it's a solar option now. Um, it's a it's a pretty minor, minor lift from Public Works. So we're, we're all pretty enthusiastic about that meeting. That's um, next Tuesday. And so I'll learn a bit more about, um, you know, the permitting and kind of the final elements to site prep and installation. Thank you. So would this qualify as staff comment at this point, project updates? Um, well, you can, you can talk about uh, B woven stories if you'd like, or it's up to you. <laughs> I really set up Christopher for failure today with the wrong numbers. I'm very okay. sorry. Okay. So um, thank you, for David, for giving the update on fine balance. This is great, it's like reliable information. All right. So uh, because I would have, I, I wasn't privy to the the meeting with with Public Works, and I was going to say my one my one observation in this is that um, this is happening. Fine balance 
is happening in a public park and we really heard nothing from parks on this and we just i i thought it was critical when the artist found that he needed something assurance that the 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 surface of the park was going to be dealt with that uh, someone could step in and do that and it's great to hear that public works is doing that so i'm really thank you for reaching out for them to them and have a good meeting next week and if you need support on that feel free to to ask the subcommittee we'll be glad to show up um uh, woven stories is uh, i think the no updates on the, the, the artists themselves, but apparently there's an, an update, um, which I think David could probably do a better job of describing than I could, but it's, um, um, yet again, uh, David uh, working diligently to, to work out an agreement where, with, uh, um, with the school district to get the, to get the uh, artwork installed there and running up against some issues. So maybe you could just describe where that is. Sure, yeah, it's been, um, uh a little bit of an onerous process and because I don't want to name names, it's just been, it's been a harder process than I originally anticipated because it is a city owned site or it's a city owned parcel. Correct. But it is a, it's indefinitely leased out to the school district. So it is, you know, it's essentially we're doing, you know, uh, public art on private property for all intents and purposes. Um, and we've been in conversation since the get go of this project back in March of 2022 about confirming the site for to receive, you know, artwork. And, um, I've been working with our excellent, uh, city, um, the assistant city attorney, Dylan Brady, about what requirements we would need to license the artwork out there and get it installed. And it, it seems like a, a fairly straightforward process, which it turned out to, for some reason, not be. And so, um, to, to summarize, uh, our, our path forward is we will, for the next month, we will continue to try, um, to our best effort to get that site confirmed and that it can receive woven stories. I think in the meantime that the subcommittee, I recommend the ad hoc sub subcommittee um, work together to uh, help staff with those outreach efforts, but also we should consider a plan B site for that as well. And if by the next meeting, uh, June 22nd, we don't have any updates about the Kenilworth Junior High site, we start to go through site selection. And I think it will go a little bit quicker, in my opinion, than talking about a conceptual possible future artwork that we have no idea what it looks like and what the dimensions are, because we have a pretty solid plan of exactly what we're getting for, for, with this commission. And it will be a lot more streamlined to approach different you know, parks and rec, public works, and say, this is what we are thinking and what, you know, if we want to put it for example, not pushing anybody one way or the other, but along the Lynch Creek Trail at Lou Casey Park, what would what are the setbacks? What are the underground utilities? We can look at that very clean, and we can we can get that those tasks kind of checked off quickly, and we can get a site confirmed. So, um, so that's my recommendation and update. Thank you. Great. Well, um, I think I'm be I can speak for the, my fellow subcommittee member that we'd be happy to do with. Uh, deal with some of the outreach to try and get uh, our current site locked in. So, um, we're already doing a little bit of outreach, so hopefully, um, we'll have a more positive resolution and answer soon. So, um, any more uh, committee comment? I just had some questions about some of our past uh, meetings and things that came up. So I wasn't sure when to ask it, but um, just out of curiosity, did we hear ever anything from Lynn Deedler about the clock tower? And what about the artwork sitting at the corner, the intersection of Lake Phil and Freitas? Yeah, I can provide a, a, a small update with that. Um, unfortunately, I've reached out to Lynn Deedler several times over phone and left messages and email, and I haven't heard back. Okay. So I did um, the same, but I didn't hear back either. So. Okay. okay. Um, yeah, which is, it's hard because I know that there was a timeline attached to that okay. too, and it makes me feel like that the, we've missed that train a little bit because there was quite a bit of work to figure out, right. and it was not impossible to, without some understanding of dimensions, cost, how right. do we approach this? Um, you know, there, there's a, quite a bit to understand there. 
Um, I can speak to Home Stretch by Donna Billick uh, that was damaged by a motor vehicle accident on Lakeville and Freitas. So we uh, we had I, I contacted Preservation Arts out of Oakland and they've worked on Cherry Soda for us before. So they were kind of a, a go to to get a bid about um, looking at that artwork. The artwork is covered under our fine arts insurance. So um, that's great to know. And any costs that we need to we need to use for the public art fund to get the estimates going and get the work going will be completely 100% reimbursed um, through that insurance. So um, just wanted to be clear on that. But um, in the current process they are in is they gave us an estimate of how much work that will take to do a deep cleaning and replace the work for, uh, essentially in kind with what it originally to restore back to its original quality. Um, I imagine that we'll be working with preservation arts for the next few months and I've um, Roman Geiger is the uh, project manager on that, and I've been working with her. She's very communicative, and um, yeah, so that process is going um, quite smoothly so far. Okay, oh, so the original artist, had she moved away? Is that, I'm just uh, trying to remember what. I actually don't know if she was originally located in Sonoma County, right. but um, she, we've reached out several times because she's also the, or uh, she was involved with the uh, Basin Street, yes. uh, the Faces yeah. of Petaluma project. And she did not want to uh, be a part of that. So um, we reached out to say, would you like to be a part of this restoration effort? Any details could help? And no. no. So, um, okay. but uh, Rowan is a, is a pro and she, we've worked with actually, um, uh, I can't remember their, the name of the tile company, but we identified the tiles used for the original artwork were based out of uh, Mill Valley. So we're in, okay. in touch with them to use the same tiles as before. And um, yeah, so it, things are going quite well. Okay, thanks. Will staff time be covered as well? The uh, uh, the cost for staff time and it, with the, and insurance, the insurance coverage. That's a really great question. Yeah. I I don't know. I don't know. I'd have to look into that. Please do. Thank you. Uh, any other committee comments? A uh, couple things from here. Um, in the past, I've, I've mentioned uh, outreach to La Via, as a, um, which is the luxury apartments on Petaluma Boulevard North, potentially doing a private, um, trying to entice them to do um, artwork on their private walls, um, supported by this body, um, connecting them with artists. Um, it, it's gone dark, that communication, so um, nothing to report there. Um, I also reported on sort of discussions with the owners of a parcel at 330 East D Street, which is just south of the Petaluma Arts Center, about doing a temporary display of artwork there and having this committee be able to program that. And that's under new ownership now and had a preliminary discussion just as a sort of get to know you with um, Smart, the new owner of the parcel. And... Um, They'll, I guess we'll have discussions from here to see if uh, they're interested. Okay. And I guess the last thing I'd like to say is that there's a, a, a local artist whose work I've admired for a, for a while who died recently. And he, and we never got to the point where I sort of was going to, I was going to recommend that this body acquire a piece for the, for the city, and I'll still do that. Uh, but there's so much that has to happen in Bruce Johnson's family's world um, before that happens. But uh, I want to acknowledge his passing and uh, encourage everyone who sort of has an opportunity to go see his work and understand the work he, the work he did in, in and around Sonoma County to do so, because it's, it's just so cool and of the place. That's it for committee comment. Uh, uh, one other thing, I just wanted to um, thank Anne and all of the work that they did. I've seen the banners up. I'm sure you guys have seen the banners up. So I think that's really cool and kudos. Uh, thank you. All right, with that, we'll close committee comment. And um, is there uh, then st more staff comment? You want to give us a project update? Sure, I, I won't really. Um... I know it's getting a little bit late, but I, I won't. I wasn't really planning to talk about all the specific items on the 
project status matrix, um, aside from that, uh, we've started to pay the artist stipends for the bus shelters murals. Um, they're $800 stipends to remind the committee to um, student artists whose designs were selected. So um, I don't have an update about the timeline for installation, but I was told spring. Um, so I think spring ends next month. So uh, I'm not holding them to that, but um, I know that it's it's in the works and um, and I know it's coming. So uh, when we do find out, I was going to invite back Rihanna Frank, who joined us to make the pitch. Uh, and kind of do a, a report out, talk about, you know, um, successes, uh, lessons learned, that kind of thing. So, um, so yeah, and I, I'll just move right into um, item nine to, to as a kind of like joint, you know, put, joint item <laughs> for staff comment. But uh, I received a, f uh, I received a phone call and a few communications with David Best and Sandy Reed last week. Um, and they've been in touch regarding the site plan, the finishing the site plan for the River Arch. Um, the city, as of this month, lifted the landscaping moratorium and new planting is now permitted. So I followed up with Sandy to put together a, a work plan of what labor materials and funding um, is required to do the work as, as um, proposed before we can ask for volunteer help or contracting services or, or asking for other resources that might be required is we need to understand what, what goes into that. And then also, um, I wasn't aware about, you know, the, the benches, the, the, the arch continuation extremity pieces that, you know, he gifted fragments, as, fragments. Thank you. <laughs> I was, I was reaching for that word. Um, I didn't know that David also created another bench that was uh, created for the design. I guess it's bigger than the other other fragments. And he wanted to me to relay that that the price of that uh, piece is fifteen hundred dollars to the city. So um, I just wanted to make a note of that. I asked Sandy for the work plan before tonight's meeting, and i I don't have that work plan. I'm sorry, and I'm um, hoping to have a greater understanding of what that work looks like by you know the next meeting and hopefully i can work just with the subcommittee to to talk about what the action is on that and how do we implement it versus waiting for each meeting to make a decision and then hopefully we could streamline getting that work complete um i also received uh inquiry from creative sonoma uh, on behalf of the city of santa rosa um, reaching out to the Petaluma Public Art Committee about a public artwork called Agraria by Larry Kirkland, which is uh, in front of the entrance of the Santa Rosa Mall along 4th Street in downtown Santa Rosa. Uh, it is up for acquisition, and um, as the city of Santa Rosa is looking for a new home for that public artwork, um, that is, uh, to give you a visual description, it's a large cupped hand oh, yeah. that's, uh, I think it's about 12 or 14 feet in width, um, it's quite large, but um, I was I promised I would pass that along to this committee um, for whatever information that the committee wants to use with that. And then the, my last note was about the Black Lives Matter mural um, that we already talked about during the public comment. So I'm happy to take any questions that committee members have on project statuses or other future agenda items that we didn't talk about tonight. Could I ask a clarifying question? Back with the River Arch and David Best, um, obviously I wasn't on the committee at that time. He was awarded $75,000. And I remember reading in different minutes that he had turned it down or what, what actually happened to that? Um, I would have to pull up some archived files for that. Um, Christopher might be able to speak on that, but I won't put him on, on the spot about the original award being turned down by David Best at the time. I don't have the best memory. I have a poor memory sometimes, <laughs> but um, I don't. Uh, I do remember awarding him uh, seventy-five thousand dollars, and it being, and that's what he's been working under um, this whole time. But I think, generally speaking, he's probably um, done more work than we've, he's been right, paid for. Right, right. Um, so I was just kind in of... General, that's just that's all I recall. clarification. Did our committee actually pay him and then he just went above and beyond to well, I'd, I'd what he wanted? Or? I'd like to clarify on that too. Sure. We There were two project extensions on that. So right. one was for... 
uh, I I think it's like it was in the wheelhouse of like eight thousand and three thousand dollars geotechnical to, to cover the yeah. geotechnical analysis that was required, and then to cover some permitting. I I believe um, I don't have it in front of me, so I'm kind of pulling from my memory, and I haven't really looked at the project documents since uh, last summer. So, um, but yeah, I believe it was the final project budget was around eighty three to eighty five thousand dollars total. Okay. Thanks. Staff comment is... Staff is finished then. All right, then we'll close that. Great. Right. And with that, I'd like to thank committee member Sponger for her service and wish her well and consider this uh, meeting adjourned at uh, 851. Thank you for that note, That's very nice of you. I have my little notes. I'm so beyond that. No, she's at a wedding in Chicago or something. She often tells me I know. I know. I got my allergies and making me crazy. Hey, David, I have a question. Somebody asked me that. Okay, they said, well, they remembered the committee never paid anything to turn it down. I thought, really? That's crazy. I, just I mean, yeah, I'm sure he got paid. Well, and I think that's, that's kind of something that we should talk about moving forward is that I think in the past we, I don't want to use the word severely, but I think we've very, we've, we've, we've under budgeted our projects. And, and that's, that's a problem because we want to make sure that we budget for staff time, and we budget for maintenance, and we budget for site improvement. And so I think that's part of the, the very budgeting conversation, too, is that, I mean, it's fine to do, to do extensions and price of steel went up four times during right. the pandemic and so we should we should